Yes, please take names and addresses. Jonathan, you look like you're up to something. Just waiting for those little digits uh, to flip over to seven. I was just saying I have all my paper copies of uh, stuff. I was looking for the digital copies on the website. Um, and you know where to look for those? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay. Maureen, you can hit the record button. I've done so, thank you. Great, okay, so the planning board meeting for April 21st is your by call to order. Um, this is a remote meeting. As a result of the COVID-19 virus, the planning board will conduct the meeting via remote access as provided by Maine law. The planning board will use the software Zoom meeting to conduct the meeting and to allow the public to remotely attend and participate. The Zoom software will allow all planning board members, applicants, and members of the public to hear all discussion and hear votes, which will be taken by roll call as required by law. Um, so uh, the first item, um, oh yeah, so before we leap into that, um, so Maureen, on my screen, uh, I can see down to about the phone number for the webinar ID that begins 215. One of the things I was reading about Zoom is that since everybody has different size screens, um, you can't, you're not necessarily seeing the exact same view that Maureen is, has on her uh, laptop. So if you feel like you're not seeing something, just speak right up, okay? Make sure we know that. So, First item on tonight's agenda is the approval of the minutes for the February 24th meeting. Does anybody have any comments or questions about the minutes? Would you like a motion? Um, yes, hold on, I can't see it. Let me just uh, switch to gallery. Okay, uh, yes, I'd like a motion and remember that the uh, votes are all roll call votes. All right. So go ahead, make your motion. Motion that we accept the minutes of the uh, February 24th, 2020 meeting as submitted. Do I have a second? A second. Sec okay, that was uh, Jim Huebner. No. I think it was Peter. Peter, okay, great. Uh, go ahead and take the roll call vote, please, Maureen. Uh, Dean Podensky? Yes. Peter Curry? Yes. Andrew Gilbert? He's muted. Andrew, you need to turn your mic on. You're muted. Sorry. Do yes. you vote to approve the minutes? Thank you. Jim Hubner? Yes. Carol Ann Jordan? Yes. John Sarbeck? Yes. And Jill Shillock? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, the next item, um, I wanted to uh, discuss Pete Curry's letter. Um, I think it would be good to discuss a couple things, especially the uh, site visit question before we uh, go through um, the uh, items that may or may not require a site walk on our part. Uh, so Maureen, how would you like to, uh, Start on this. Um, Can you bring up Pete's letter? Every, has everyone read it? Yes, it's great. A great email, Peter. Very thoughtful. I was going to bring up the digital submission um, document that you already have, but I can bring up his letter. <coughs> That'll take a, another moment. Uh, I've got it here. If you want to throw it over to me, I can throw it over to you. No problem. Okay. Well, I can throw it over you. I'm not going to say no problem. <laughs> you two are getting good at this. Well, well, before fall. You are viewing Maureen's screen. And 
you are the host now. Okay, so. Yeah, yeah, the screen's not liking this totally. I just had a chance to skim it, skim through it before I signed into the meeting, so I didn't read it closely. Okay, can people see that? Yes, <laughs> that's good. All right. Really? Is it too wide? It's too small. Very too small. small type. The type's too small. Okay, let's, let's try to zoom. Just a smidge. Uh, there you go. All right, yeah. how's that? Good. Can everybody read that? Yes. Yep. Um, so the first item, public, and then, uh, so I, I, as I recall in the first time I did this, so I was having some trouble seeing when hands were raised. Um, and I don't seem to have that part of the screen right here. So I think the idea of people just raising their hand or even uh, just calling out, I think would be fine for now. You might be able to perfect that later, but I don't really have a problem with that. You mean raising our hands such the way Peter suggests in, in the video or? Well, you have the hand clicker, but like right. I don't see it on my screen right now. If somebody raises yeah, their hand, either. I can't see it. Yeah. I don't have it. I don't either. You you would have to go in by the C raised hand. Okay. You would have to get on the participants icon. So who's ever in by the C you we I saw you raise your hand. So that's good. Uh, okay. Andrew, why don't you try raising your hand a second? Well, I was able to do it last oh, week. Jim Hubner raised his hand. Okay, so it's coming up on my screen. Are you seeing oh, that, there it Maureen? Is. Two um, participants. Okay, everyone's raising yes, their hand. Yes, I'm seeing it. All right. So I don't have it on my, on my uh, control. Yeah, yeah, I think you do. You got to go down to participants. It's under the little dots where it says invite, mute me, and then there's... Oh, got it. Okay, got it. I'm yeah. sorry. You're right. Absolutely. Yep. I just raised my hand. Okay. All right. Oh, I see. Okay. I got the panels. All right. Great. So, but again, you know, if, if you raise your hand and nobody calls, just, I, I think we're going to have to just jump in. All right. Um, interactive will also be tricky. All right. Sidewalks. Maureen, you want to review what you told me about the sidewalks? Okay, yes. Uh, so, uh, kind of a question came up of how you're going to handle sidewalks. And so I threw it out onto the main association of planners listserv to get some feedback from other planners in the state. And kind of what we came up with was uh, that I think you can hold a site, site walk. Um, we would absolutely have to follow CDC guidelines, which means that uh, everyone would have to wear a mask. Everyone would have to say at least six feet apart from each other. And uh, I think we would have to close it to members of the public because you can't have more than 10 people at a gathering. However, um, if you videoed, and by you, I mean me, if I were to take a video of the site walk that you conducted, I could then put it on the website. And by that, I mean the webmaster would put it on the website. And that site walk would be available for the public to, to, to see. So that seemed like an option, but the question you know, does become, and this was raised, is how comfortable the board would be with that. I mean, obviously you are getting together and we have to maintain our, our, our distance. Um, another option would be just to have me go and do a site visit. Um, I, I'm thinking that has less value for you. Maureen, and Jonathan raised his hand. I did see that, yes. Oh, okay. Um, Obviously, yeah, the 10 people guideline would be sort of the, the thing that would make it difficult. 
would we only need to videotape if we got to the point where we invited the public, but some members of the public didn't show up and didn't get well, to that 10 person threshold and then recording? The way I counted, yes. Yeah, the way I counted it up was there are seven members of the board plus me, that's eight. And the applicant would be limited to two representatives. That gets you to 10. Uh, yeah. would, okay, so it's saying. And then, and then the idea would be that the, the public is just not going to be allowed to attend, right. but uh, we would videotape the entire site visit and post it online um, so that the public still has complete access to the site visit that you conducted, which in, in, in a lot of ways is more access than they have for your site visits now because only the people that attend get to hear what's discussed. Yeah, that's uh, a Jim. good suggestion. Jim raised his hand. Jim? Yeah, who's going to video it? And that would add one more person if you got a separate person. No, it, that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because we okay, can't uh, add another person. Yeah. Uh, let me just make a statement here because I noticed that some of the participants are raising their hand. And the participants have a chance to make comments during public comment and public hearing. But other than that, we don't normally uh, invite the public to participate in the discussion. Um, if you can, uh, any questions or comments you have on particular issues, you can definitely email Maureen and um, she will make us aware of those items. Um, Peter. Yeah, uh, Maureen, as I was trying to think this, this thing through, <clears throat> I think we have to also anticipate this will be a, a little bit of a moving target on the requirements. And while the 10 person rule is certainly in, in, the, in effect for the moment, I think it's gonna be changing and loosening. And I think as a matter of policy, we ought to look forward to and almost welcome the chance to have the public there in some fashion, because that's really at the heart of what we do. Um, and so for the moment, you know, we can, we can certainly observe the 10 people thing, but I think we ought to be thinking about ways to accommodate the public. Um, and cause it's, I, I just think it's important. Well, I mean, there's certainly, you can live stream events and, you know, maybe Maureen can take a look at some of that technology. Um, it's, you know, it, I, we have to be careful about how much technology we add because there's always room for uh, problems. Um, but I, Maureen, you're laughing. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm laughing. Yeah. Um, so otherwise, I, I mean, I, I, that's definitely something we could look into is the live streaming of it. But I think to begin with, it seems like Maureen's suggestion is um, probably a really just easy and straightforward right. way to go. And I, I just want to make sure we had uh, considered this before we actually started looking at any of these applications. Um, Joe? Yeah, Maureen. I mean, one of the other options was to not have the planning board do it at all and just have staff do it. and. Um, I just felt that the board has always been very hands-on and this was a more expansive opportunity for you, this kind of protocol, than to just not have anybody be able to go on any site in a group. Yeah, and it's also, as you had mentioned to me, that it's not, you know, the understanding is that none of the board members would have to go, you know, if you preferred not to take part in a meeting like that. Um, Joe? Yeah. 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 I just want to uh, say that, like everything else right now, it's everything's a moving target to Peter's point. And I don't want to not be able to attend site walks. So, whatever we have to do to try and make it work at this time, and as things change, things evolve, and we change the rules. So, I mean, that's all we can do. That's the way life is right now. Yeah, I agree. So everybody, uh, Andrew. Yeah, sorry. I think I don't think the hand thing is really working because I, I think Carolyn and I have had the hand thing up for a while. So we might want to do okay. what 
Peter said, which is just the, that. I like the hand wave. It's easier for me okay. to see. Yeah. That works for you. Because um, I notice that, on my screen, sometimes the hands are waving, sometimes not. <laughs> so yeah, I like the hand, the waving on screen. Okay. That wasn't my actual point. My, my point was that I think actually what um, Maureen came up with seems pretty clean. I think live streaming seems like a terrible idea. Um, for, yeah. From a, IT perspective, there's any number of things that go wrong. I think keeping it as simple as possible right now, knowing that it just really isn't great options, um, given it's sort of an in-situ walk. So there's not even going to be good uh, internet signal in all parts of Cape. So right. I think you don't even want to give that expectation that that can happen. So I think doing exactly what she said. And, and I, I think I agree, like most people probably wouldn't show up the site walk. They couldn't because they're at work or whatever. Now, more likely these days, people might have the opportunity, but having them be able to see it is safer for them via video. And, you know, you don't get as broad a view, but um, there's definitely some advantages, I think. Uh, All right, so Maureen, procedurally, do we have to uh, do anything to, it sounds like we, we pretty much reach a consensus on uh, doing the sidewalks as you described. Yeah, I, I think because of the way we are continuing to evolve with this COVID-19 event, a consensus agreement at a public meeting is, is adequate for now. Okay, awesome. All right. So um, does anyone have any other thoughts on that or can I move on? And I'm gonna stop sharing here. Uh, and I can give, so Maureen, you can take it back. Okay, so um, our first applicant is, um, Okay. Open house. Just, I can I'm go ahead and do the beginning. Something that's here. So our first applicant is uh, the in by. Excuse me. Is by is the Ocean House Commons project, and I believe we have. Um, I think this. I think this person. I think Susan Mitchell is our attendee. So. Okay. Let's see if let me, I can. I can let me go ahead and do the introduction from the memo here. That's um, great. Let me see what I can do on. And you can get that person up. So uh, this is the Ocean House Common Subdivision and Site Plan Extension. Uh, David Jacobson, on behalf of the Ocean House Common Site Plan Amendment and Subdivision, located at 326 Ocean House Road is requesting a 90-day extension of the planning board approval granted December 17, 2019. The request will be reviewed for compliance with section 1626B subdivision post approval requirements. Now this application has been placed on the consent agenda. So if anybody wants to have substantive discussion of this application, we'll need to make a motion uh, to move the application to the regular agenda. Otherwise, a motion for approval would be in order. Um, so the person representing Ocean House Common is a, who? Is, give me a moment, I'm, I'm having a little difficulty. Okay. Panelist. Um, and it's not coming up. It was is he the, the host? Oh, Joe, did you, are you oh, still the I, host? No, I don't want to be the host anymore. That's why I'm, it's not working. <laughs> How do I? Okay, so I so think. So what do I um, do? Host. You go me. to participants. Yeah. And you go to panelists, and you click on me, and you make me. And it, there's there should be a ah, more. Option. I got you. I got you. Okay, make host. Do you want to change the host? All right. Well, yeah, because I can't do the other. I can't do what you want otherwise. So, thank you. All right. All right. No, it's all right. All right, um, not panelists. Susan Mitchell. I'm here. Can and, you hear me? And I believe that's John Mitchell. 
Yes, can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you, we can't see you. Do you, do you have your video on? Um, the video should... Susan, you have a deep voice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If you go in the lower left-hand corner, okay. you're screwed. Yeah. Hey. Hey, John. So, John, we have we have t actually. I can. I don't have a plan because all you have is your request. So, with the permission of the chair, I would say that you should just um, make your request. Yes, I second. Okay. All right. Um, well, the 90-day limit was uh, was up, I believe, last month. However, we requested the 90-day extension, I believe, in February. So, um, according to Ma Maureen, as, as long as we re had re requested it, uh, we were okay to uh, go beyond the 90 days. So, we're here <clears throat> to request the 90-day extension. Um, uh, this, the, the update on the project is that we have received our DEP stormwater permit uh, a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> so we're, we're ready to go. Uh, the only thing that uh, needs to be done um, is, as far as the conditions of approval, uh, are to um, submit the signed stamped copy of the subdivision plan and pay the open space impact fee. Um, so that's, that's all that's left to do. Um, and then we can, uh, record once the plan is signed by the planning board members, we can record it and, and that will be it. Okay. Um, great. Does anybody, uh, have any questions or comments? Andrew? Yeah. How are we going to do signing? <laughs> <laughs> Maureen. Sorry, beat me to it. <laughs> Maureen, how my... are we going to do signing? I, I actually have an idea. Do you want to talk about that right now? Might as well. Yes. Okay, oh, so. Should we actually, should we take a vote here? I mean, should we make, should oh, we clear yeah. John up so we can get but, on to the rest of his life? And I have a motion. Should we take a vote? No, I, do you I want to hear this. <laughs> okay. You want to know how we're going to do the signing. <laughs> So before you take a vote, do you want to make sure there's nobody who wants to make any public comment? I just checked nobody had their hands up, but Joe, you probably want to ask. Okay. Uh, does anybody wish to make a public comment about this item? And they need to raise their hand. And I don't see any hands raised. All right. Seeing none, the public comment session is closed. Good. So Maureen, how are we going to sign these? Um, well, again, we need to come up with something that people are comfortable with. Uh, as you all know, the town hall is closed. In the past, we've brought these plans to a board meeting and I've collected your signatures. People could drop by town hall. Um, the best thing I can come up with is for me to take the plan to each of your places of work or abode and ask you to sign it. And I stand outside and you sign it. I'm okay doing that, but you know there is some lim there is some risk that you're you know meeting me at the door wearing a mask and gloves. Maureen, the town hall is open a few hours each uh, day, and but it's not open, days, isn't it? But it's not open to the public. Oh, not to the public. Okay. No members of the public are allowed inside the building at this time. Uh, Maureen, this Dan, I know that you can. <clears throat> there's a there's a way to sign PDFs. Um, we're doing that in my firm, um, just throwing that out to you. And, and, and I appreciate that, and, you know, this was the discussion of the planners on the earlier map listserv discussion, and um, they didn't come up with a good option on how to uh, virtually sign the plan. Okay. And I, I, again, I have, I always have concerns with doing things that might expose the town to legal challenges. But if, if anyone is uncomfortable, I mean, I don't have a problem with visiting you one by one, but there is still the someone's coming to your door with something from outside um, asking you to touch mm. it and sign it. 
I'm fine with that. Has, does the registry, has the registry been heard of what they will accept for signatures? Would they accept, for, for example, a certificate from each person? They, we can no, they, uh, they uh, are accepting original signatures. Only? Correct. As uh, far as I know. Mm. I'm okay with Maureen's suggestion. Yeah. Well, you, you need five signatures, right? Yes, and, and Mr. Hubner had his hand up. Sorry, Jim. Could you, is the public safety, the foyer or something in the public safety building open? We could leave him on a table and we could go in there. I don't know if that's, that's a good idea. <clears throat> hmm. I don't know. I mean, I'm right next to the fire station. I could put them on a table next to my office, but it would be outside. Yeah, the, and the hallway of your office would be... Uh, I don't have a hallway. <laughs> <laughs> I have a door and an office. Yeah, it'd probably be easier to everybody go to one spot and just sign it rather than coordinate yeah. Maureen when we'll be home. Jim. Uh, how about or the library? I'm sure they got a room, you know. The library is oh. the library is closed to the public. That's right. So it's okay. really only the fire station that's open, right? You're, Carol Ann has her phone. Carol Ann, nice here's a strange you. idea. Maureen designates a time. We go to the parking lot and we meet her at the back of her car and we sign the plan, and we make sure to stay six feet apart while we're doing it and we wear our masks and we do all the proper things, but we all go to the town hall and meet in the parking lot, meet Maureen in the parking lot. That's another idea. Let's assume everybody can do it at the same time. That is true. You'd have to do I get a group of you, <laughs> yeah. I, I can always get most of you and then pick off the few remaining people with individual signing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that sounds good. I like that suggestion. People might think there's some strange deal going on, but. <laughs> so John, we'll make it work. Okay. Um, the registry has recently uh, changed some of their, their rules. Um, they are no longer accepting my laws. Correct. Uh, so this is going to be an original paper copy. Um, yep. As I said, they're, they're requiring original signatures. And the other thing, which is very important, is that they are not accepting um, a paper copy that is torn or wrinkled or creased. Um, if there are any creases or wrinkles, they're not accepting it. So that's the, the one uh, thing that I'm, I'm requesting is that we take extra care not to uh, you know, wrinkle or crease the paper copy. Okay. No spilling coffee on it. No spilling coffee. Would you like a motion? I would love one. Thank you. Be it ordered that based on the request submitted and the facts presented, the request of David Jacobson on behalf of the Ocean House Common Site Plan Amendment and Subdivision located at 326 Ocean House Road for a 90 day extension of the planning board approval granted. December 17, 2019, be approved to the extension to July 10, 2020. Do I have a second? Jim? Any discussion? All in favor? Oh, I'm sorry. Roll call. Please. <laughs> we can hold up our hand. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. Well, you can hold up your yeah. hand, but it, it doesn't count. All right. So, uh, Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. And Mr. Shalott. Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. Uh, okay. So Maureen, uh, we added that note that you asked us to and we, 
we sent you a copy. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it. Maybe you want to call me tomorrow at the office. Okay. 10 to 2, I'm there. 10 to 2. Mm -hmm. I'll call you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, John. Okay. Good to see you. Um, the next item. Next item on the agenda uh, is the Edgecombe Way Private Road Extension, um, an RP permit. Jay Cox is requesting review to extend the Edgecombe Way Private Road located in the area of 75 Ocean House Road and a resource protection permit to alter 3,988 square feet of RP2 wetland to provide access to potential future lots. The Planning Board has previously approved the combined Edgecombe Way private road slash private access way. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 1979 private roads and section 1983 resource protection permit. Um, so to begin with, the uh, applicant will summarize any changes made since the last meeting. Uh, and then we'll open the uh, board to the to a public hearing for any comments. And then we can begin discussion of the application. So Maureen, are is uh, Jay, are you, is Jay going to host this or are you? Um, we had uh, Jay Cox and I talked this morning and he would like me to good afternoon good evening jay how are you doing hi jay can you hear us you need to unmute your mic lower left and i'm going to put your plan up He's talking, but we can't hear him. Yeah, we'll get there. Um, all right. Jay, did you unmute yourself? Okay, so Jay, are you saying anything? We can't, can anybody hear him? No. no. All right. Um, okay, you're gonna try one more thing. Okay. He's gonna try one more thing. In the meantime, should I start with the introduction? I, I, I guess we'll yeah. just wait for Jay. He could probably dial in and also share a screen. And we, we do have someone who's already, we have two attendees now down to one that dialed in. Um, oh yeah, you can dial in on your cell phone. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, yes. that often yeah. works really well for, for audio and then you could still have share your screen. It's just that you, you can do actually do both. Or you should so, be able to. Jay, the other thing you can do is you can dial in. Oh, he needs the number. Yeah, that's why I'm trying to pull that up. Um, <laughs> let's 
So oh, yeah, today, if you could see, if you could see right here under telephone on the agenda, if you could try dialing in. I have another idea. Mm -hmm. I could just call my cell phone number. I could just call him. Number ID. A, Webinar ID, it's right under there, Participant 10. Participant 10, got him. Is that you, Jay? Oh, he wants participant ID number. Oh. Um, what about a webinar ID number? We have a webinar ID number. Will that help? They may not be able to speak, the people who are just webinar folks. I don't know. He may have to be a panelist. Well, he can see us and hear us, though, right? Let's see if we can make him. No, it won't let me do that. You can't be a panelist if you call in, but I can I can allow you to talk, which I have identified. We've got one caller here and it it doesn't look like his number. Huh. He's turned his phone off. What are you doing, Maureen? Saying, call me? <laughs> yeah. It's not working either. Yeah, too bad we got all to know American Sign Language. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> all right. Um, I got. I'm. I'm out of ideas. Uh, hmm. I, think Jay needs to I mean, one out. suggestion would be for uh, Jay and Todd and Quirky to try and set up a Zoom meeting with each other and see if they can figure out what's going on with their microphones. Oh, none of them? I, I mean, it's possible that Jay's mic is not turned on in his computer. Jay, have you checked that you're microphone is turned on in your computer. And Maureen, you did the exact same stuff that you did with John to bring him on board, right? Um, yes. So the only other thing I can do is I, I brought on two other 
applicants, I can, can take them if, off. Can we see if we can get Todd or Corky talking? Okay. All right. Let's see if we can get Todd. And um, Todd's there. Todd, are you there? I am here. Okay. We don't have video because I assume you didn't turn it on, but you can hear us. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can. It's good to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I am alive. Well, all right. Um, I don't know. Have we lost so Jay I kind of think Jay should, is he trying to call in? Because he's shown here as a participant with this phone number, 802-287-8888. Yeah, I don't, I don't, it's nothing's happening with it. Um, on, no, I can't, I can't get to it. Okay. Uh, the only options available to me are things that remove him. Let me put it that way. I can remove him, I can disable him, I can mute his audio, I can rename him, I can hide him, I can't do anything else. I don't know, Andrew. You're IT. <laughs> what do you... Yeah, I don't know. Which is which is his number? You think just the the, the single number there, eight zero two two eight eight zero two eight seven eight. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. yeah it, that's, it did that's... show some audio coming from it for a second there. When I don't know what you know the you have the little phone <laughs> icon. Yeah, I mean generally. Yeah, it's often right. that the, the machine is muted and people don't realize it. There's a, there's a, mechanic, okay, I've got, you know, a button that mutes and unmutes. And then there's also the mute from, from uh, Zoom. So you have several levels of muting. Uh, everything I have appears to be saying it's not muted and I'm trying yeah. to let him talk. Right. Uh, should work from a phone. Is, but we're not even certain yeah, he's I, there necessarily. I no. tried to call him and he didn't answer yeah. his phone. <laughs> well, um, he would know we're trying to call him because he can hear us. So is yeah, that him there, Jay? Got it. As Jay is as Jay? in the uh, panel or the attendees? Jay. All right, hang on, everyone. I've I've got him on the phone. So I had to get out of the meeting and then then change the privacy setting. But if you want to try it on Zoom, I think it's working now. Can everybody hear him? Yeah. Okay. Let me let me see if that'll work. <clears throat> Are you hearing me on the phone or on Zoom? Not on Zoom. Not at all on Zoom, Jay. I, I've put my my cell phone on speaker. Can everybody hear him? Big echo. Yeah, it's a lot of it's an infinite loop there. It, oh, oh, he just hung up. I don't know who that 802 number is, but it's not Jay. Okay. Yeah, that's me. Steve. Steve. Okay. Yep. So you can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Don't go in here, Steve. I won't. No, I'm I'm here. Okay, so Joe, what do you want me to do? He he called I I was hoping oh if he would <laughs> are you willing to just work with it if, with him on my cell phone? Yeah, if we can if we if we can make Hello? it intelligible. Okay, Jay, what we'd like to do is can you see the Zoom meeting on your computer? So I'm going to just put my phone on speaker and the board is going to hear you through through me. Okay. 
All right, so I'm, I'm going to let you take this over. All right. All right, it's not gonna work. Okay, it's not working on Zoom. I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Oh, you're in it. Okay. All right. So I have a. I have. Oh, are you okay? Oh, right there you are. All right. Let's try this. This will work. Maureen, can he log out and log back in? I mean, mine sometimes doesn't have audio the first time. Okay. I've got jctpi at att.net. Is that you? Hey, it's unmuted. There you go. I'm hanging up. Okay. All right. Sounds like we got Jay. Nice to hear your voice, Jay. <laughs> yeah, the echo wouldn't work. <laughs> no. All right. So, uh, Maureen, you want to bring up uh, Jay's drawing, and then uh, we can leap into it here. And someone's phone is ringing. Is that what I'm hearing? No, I think it's digital hum or something. I've been hearing that through the whole meeting, actually. Oh, okay. All right. Fire away, Jay. Okay. Um, I am Jay Cox here for uh, KGM LLC. Uh, it's Skip and Chris Murray to again discuss a proposed extension of the previously approved private road, private access way, Edgecombe Way. It's located at 75 Ocean House Road. I'm not gonna bother with a location map tonight because I think we're pretty familiar with it. But in any case, it's uh, right, essentially right across the street from uh, Can the Canterbury entrance off 77. Um, it has been a while, so I thought I'd do a short review of the, uh, the entire proposal. And we have the site plan up, so. Um, we are interested in extending Edgecombe Way about 275 feet uh, to access a wet, uh, an upland that's beyond the wetland. Uh, this requires private road review, and we're also seeking a resource protection permit to impact uh, uh, the RP2 in order to, uh, again, access that wetland. Uh, we're proposing the same waivers as under the previous approval. That is an 18 foot traveled way within a 35 foot right of way. Um, in addition, we would construct two foot grass shoulders on each side of the uh, traveled way. Um, we're also requesting a waiver for the right of way dimension at the turnaround as the configuration is uh, somewhat different than what's in the uh, uh, subdivision ordinance. And as the extended road would create frontage, which might be used by a butters to create lots, we've agree, agreed to uh, install the necessary utilities to support a maximum of four lots, which we calculate is uh, all that could ever be created to uh, use the frontage. Um, we're therefore proposing to install proper water, sewer, power, and signal infrastructure to support these four lots, and this would all be constructed within the uh, road right away. And they would be done per the relevant utilities requirements and the town's requirements. Uh, we'll get to a utility plan, which was created for or subsequent to the last meeting in just a, just a little bit. Uh, we are proposing a T turnaround at the end of the road. Uh, the design of the turnaround itself meets the standards of alternative two in appendix D. Uh, it can be negotiated by a B40 vehicle. Um, as we said earlier, or as I said earlier, the uh, right of way itself is slightly different just because the road is uh, narrower than the 50 foot uh, road envisioned in the standards. And we offset the part of the turnaround a little bit within the right of way. 
Uh, the drive and turnaround would be constructed and paved to town and DOT standards. Um, we've incorporated a 36 inch culvert uh, at the end of the road, park, uh, transecting the uh, turnaround. Uh, this is a little bigger than what's needed or quite a bit bigger than what's needed for water, but uh, the, the purpose is to improve contiguity between the separated parts of the wetland. Ongoing maintenance of the road and culvert would be borne by the uh, anyone who constructs uh, a house uh, utilizing the frontage of the extended road. Uh, it's, part, uh, it's required in a road maintenance agreement and the new, lo new lot owners are explicitly required to maintain the road and stormwater infrastructure. And it might be a little premature, but we've amended the road maintenance agreement to require annual reporting to the town as well uh, by a third party to be contracted by uh, the ultimate owners. Stormwater is proposed to be directed on site by sloping the road grade uh, towards our parcel. Uh, also, to the greatest extent possible, runoff is directed into uh, vegetated areas and woods uh, to improve dispersal and uh, infiltration. The RP2 wetland on site will receive runoff and it's a, it's a large buffer for any uh, runoff leaving the paved area. Once runoff leaves the parcel, it does so in well-established channels, ditches, culverts, and swales that currently handle the runoff of this uh, watershed, as well as other flows coming from other areas, but they currently flow into the same uh, DEP brook. Uh, further downstream, a large receiving wetland and swale there conveys the flows to a town-maintained culvert, which passes under Spurlink Road and then, and then beyond. Uh, we revised, revisited, actually revisited uh, the downstream stormwater flows per Mr. Harding's requirement and did a complete analysis, which you have. Uh, we've included the analysis detail, but the conclusion is that for the two 25 and 100 year flows, the increase in potential head at, Perputic, at the Paputic culvert uh, was negligible. Specifically, it's an increase of about point one foot or about a half, about an inch. Um, as for permits, uh, no state permits are required as uh, this impact is under the state threshold of 4,300 square feet of wetland impact. Um, the proposed impacts fall under an Army Corps statewide permit and they've been um, engaged to uh, review this as well as our, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Um, all work that's proposed would be done to all the relevant standards of the town, uh, state, and uh, federal, uh, particularly regarding erosion and sediment control. Uh, the recess resource protection permit, our request is to impact uh, 3,988 square feet of RP2 wetland to construct the drive and turn around and install utilities. Uh, once again, this is to access the wetland area, the 20, roughly 20,000 square foot wet upland area that's beyond the, the wetland. Uh, next, I'd like to address Mr. Harding's memo of 15 January a little bit. I won't go through his letter point by point. Uh, I can say that we've uh, complied with every uh, point. Um, obviously, I'll be happy to answer any uh, questions or elaborate on any points that you might like me to. Um, I'd like to touch on the utility plan just a little bit because it's a new drawing uh, and was not presented at the last meeting. Maureen, could you put up that L4 utility plan? Working on it. Yeah.
There it is, Jay. Yep. Um, with the caveat that the final um, installation will be per the requirements of the uh, CMP and, and um, Portland Water District primarily, as well as the town, uh, this is essentially what it would look like. Um, this has been, we have, it's been preliminarily approved by both the district and by CMP. Um, there's one transfer uh, that would drop the voltage for secondary um, house use. Um, and that would branch off to all four potential lots. And the water is brought in. Uh, two of the lines are through uh, manholes or yeah, manholes. Uh, because of the distance from the main and in Route 77, the others are within uh, 200 feet, so they don't require manholes. I won't beat this up too much, but I just wanted to put it up because you haven't had a chance to really look at it before. We've also, one other point, we've changed the uh, lot numbering a little bit before we were trying to use the lot numbering from the previously approved plan and then add in these three additional uh, potential lots. Uh, now I think it's, it's a little more clear, you'll see. And then lastly, uh, budding land over, landowner feedback. Uh, we continue to communicate and solicit input from uh, all the neighbors. Uh, the Ashmans are the most impacted as this is closest to their home. Uh, we've done our best to keep the majority of the turnaround uh, away from their home and also work with Mr. Ashman to cite uh, seven Serbian spruce that we proposed for screening. There's a drawing of that, but I think the site plan shows them as well, Maureen, so either one would probably work. They're right there on the kind of bottom left of the turnaround. And again, those were, we went out there with Mr. Ashman and looked at his house and tried to picture where lights might flash the house and, and did our best to block that. And I, I think that's really about it. Um, happy to elaborate or answer any questions. All right. Um... Thank you, Jay. Uh, at this point, I'd like to open the meeting up to uh, public uh, hearing, see if anyone uh, wishes to make a comment or has a question about this application. So Joe, I'm, I'm looking at the list of attendees and no one has raised their hand. Okay. Um, if someone wants to speak, they need to go to the participants icon, find their name, and then select raise hand. All right. Well, seeing none, we see none. We see none. Okay. Seeing none, the public hearing is closed. Members of the board, do you have any questions for Jay? No, I think he's responded to everything that we have asked him to at the site. Yeah, block. it seems pretty straightforward. I do have one question for Maureen, and it's not much of a question, but is there any issue with running stubs to future lots that to lots that are not officially lots yet? Um, this is a private road. So yeah. it's really up to the applicants, and, but I can tell you in the past with public roads, uh, the town has been very supportive of installing stubs because then it avoids tearing up uh, the road surface. So it, it's overall considered a good practice. Just because you install a stub doesn't mean you're entitled to a lot that you haven't created yet. Okay. Is that what you were worried about? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, then if there are no further questions, uh, Joe, I can I, Joe, this yes, is, John, I just want to say one thing. I, I've been impressed with, um, how much 
the, the applicant has done on this to address the concerns of the neighbors on this. I know it's not ideal to be in a situation where someone's building on a, a lot so close to someone's property line, but I, I do have to uh, tip my cap to the applicant with regards to trying to limit the impact that this is going to be have going to have on an abutter. Um, so I just want to point that out there. Uh, so people are aware of that, that we have given all that a consideration um, as this application has been going forward. Great. Would anybody like to make a motion? I can make one. You can have this one. All right. Jonathan. Sure. Uh, so this would be a motion for the board to consider a uh, findings of facts, uh, Jay Cox, number one, Jay Cox is proposing to extend the Edgecombe Railway private road located in the area of 75 Ocean House Road and a resource protection permit to alter 3,988 square feet of RP2 wetland, which requires review for compliance with section 19-7-9 private roads and section 19-8-3 the resource protection permit. Number two, the road, the road extension will not result in undue water pollution the road ex extension is not located in the 100 year floodplain. Soils will support the proposed uses, the slope of the land, proximity to streams, and state and local water resource rules and regulations will not be compromised by the project. Number three, the potential lot gaining access from Edgecombe Way, um, excuse me, Edgecombe Way will uh, have a sufficient quantity and quality of potable water. Number four, the road extension will not cause soil erosion based on the erosion control plan provided. Number five, the road extension will not cause unreasonable road congestion or unsafe vehicular and pedestrian traffic. And the road extension uh, provides for road network connectivity while discouraging through traffic. The road extension is laid out to conform to existing topography as much as feasible. Potential lots are provided with vehicular access. The road extension is designed to meet towns <coughs> with waivers granted for a roadway, excuse me, a road right of way reduction from 50 mm -hmm. feet to 35 feet and road traveled surface reduction from 22 to feet to 18 feet plus two feet of grass shoulders. Number six, the road extension will provide for adequate sewage disposal by installing a public sewer line connection available for potential loss. Number seven, the road extension will not result in solid waste disposal after uh, construction, or excuse me, will provide, or excuse me, will result in solid waste disposal after construction. Did I read that right? Yes, okay. Number eight, the road extension will not have an undue adverse impact on scenic or nature or natural areas, historic sites, significant wildlife habitat, rare natural areas, or public access to the shoreline. Number nine, the road extension is compatible with applicable provisions of the comprehensive plan and town ordinances. Number 10, the applicant has demonstrated adequate technical and financial capability to complete the project. Number 11, the road extension is not a, is not located in the shoreland performance overlay district and will not adversely impact surface water quality. Number 12, the road extension will not adversely impact the quality and quantity of groundwater. Number 13, the road extension uh, is not located in the 100 year floodplain. Again, uh, number 14, the road extension is in compliance with the town wetland regulations and the zoning ordinances subject to the issuances of a resource protection permit. Number 15, the road extension will provide for adequate stormwater management. Number 16, the road extension is not located in the watershed of Great Pond. Number 17, a road extension is not located in more than one municipality. Number 18, the road extension is not located on land where liquidation harvesting was conducted. Number 19, the road extension will provide potential lots with access to utilities. Number 20, the proposed road extension will not material, materially obstruct the flow of surface or subsurface waters across or from the alteration area. Number 21, the proposed road extension will not impound surface, or surface waters or reduce the absorptive capacity of the alt 
alteration area so as to cause or increase the flooding of adjacent properties. Number 22, the proposed road extension will not substantially increase the flow of surface waters across or the dis discharge of surface waters from the alteration area so as to threaten injury to the alteration area or to upstream and or downstream lands by flooding, draining, erosion, sedimentation, or otherwise. Number 23, the proposed road extension will not result in significant damage to spawning grounds or habitat for aquatic life, birds, or other wildlife. Number 24, the proposed road extension will not pose problems related to the support of structures. Number 25, the proposed road extension will not be detrimental to aquifer recharge or the quantity and quality of groundwater. Number 26, the proposed road extension is not located in coastal dunes or contagious, or contagious back dune areas. Number 27, the proposed road extension uh, will maintain or improve ecological and aesthetic values. Number 20, the road extension will be accomplished in conformance with the erosion prevention provisions of the Environmental Quality Handbook Erosion and Sediment, Sediment Control published by the Maine Soil and Water Conservation Commission dated March 1986 or subsequent revisions thereof. Number 29, the road extension will be accomplished without discharging wastewater from buildings or from other construction into wastewater treatment facilities. Um, wait a second, that should be a, a, let me start that one over again, 29. The road extension will not be accomplished without discharging. I did do it right with Will. Yeah. Sorry, it's a double negative there. The road extension will be accomplished without discharging wastewater from buildings or from other construction to wastewater treatment facilities in violation of section 15-1-4 of the sewage ordinance. And number 30, the applicant has substantially addressed the standards of the subdivision ordinance section 16-3-1 and section 19-8-3 of the resource protection regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials Submitted in facts presented the application of Jay Cox to extend the Edgecombe Way private road located in the area of 75 Ocean House Road and a resource protection per permit to alter 3,988 square feet of RP2 wetland be approved subject to the following conditions. Number one, that the plans be revised to address the recommendations of the town engineer's letter dated March 9, 2000, 20, 2020. Number two, that the Army Corps engineers permit a permit be obtained before any construction of on the site occurs. Number three, that all potential lots with frontage to Edgecombe Way be connected to the public sewer system. And number four, that there be no alteration of the site until the plans materials have been revised to address the above conditions and submitted to the town planner and the plan be signed by the planning board and recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. Do I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion of the motions? No. Nothing on any of the findings? Okay, Maureen, please take a roll call. Mr. Bedensky. Oh. Yes. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Starbeck. Yes. And Mr. Shalott. Yes. Great. The motion passes. It's unanimous. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, folks. Appreciate you putting up with my mic malfunction, and uh, good luck with everything. Thanks. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, Jay. All right. Next item. The next item on the agenda is the In by the Sea Cabana Site Plan Amendment. The In by the Sea, located at 40, 40 Bowery Beach Road, is requesting an amendment to the previously approved site plan to install two seasonal 10 foot by 10 foot cabanas on the southeast corner lawn. The application will be reviewed for compliance with Section 19.9 Site Plan Regulations. Um, the applicant will begin with a summary of the project. After that, we will have a public comment period on completeness. Um, so uh, who's here representing In by the Sea? 
I have, I believe Michael Briggs is here and I'm working on promoting him to a panelist. Okay. And it's uh, taken a bit of time, I guess. And if you could just, a little patience, thank you. No problem. So he, he's not an attendee anymore, which is both good and bad. Um, oh, here we go. Okay. Okay, so he's raising his hand, allowed to talk. Mr. Briggs, okay, you're... Can you hear me, Maureen? Yes. Okay. So I can put up your pan, pan excuse me, your plan. For some reason, um, I'm not allowed to promote you to a panelist. Can you get rid of uh, Todd Gammon and... I, I sure Orky? can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if that'll help. Yeah, let's see. Uh, all right, I've been demoted. Okay, he's a panelist now, in theory. Okay, Michael, have do you, you have video? I can see you all, but um, I should have. If you go to the lower left-hand corner, you should be see it. You, you should see something that says start video. You hover over the left. Let's see. Uh, no, that's the sound. Next to the sound. Uh, video settings. Uh, video. Yeah. If you did. you want to get out of the settings and just hover over start. And it should be just to the left of that, assuming you have. No, I don't see it. Okay. My, my lower left is just a mute, unmute. Okay, to the right of that, it doesn't have a little video icon? No. Okay. Hmm. Well, all right. Well. But we can certainly, if you can hear me, we could probably go through if that works for you. Yeah. Is everybody seeing this plan? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Mike, do you want to introduce your proposal? Yes, yeah, again, it's, uh, it's Michael Briggs and the general manager down at Inn by the Sea. And um, you'll see in, in, the, uh, in the site plan amendment that Casco Bay Engineering had uh, worked with me on last month, we've added two 10 by 10 uh, cabana structures that we're looking to, to activate on our event lawn. Um, the idea was about mid-May through Columbus Day, um, where it's generally an underutilized um, area of our resort. And uh, essentially the, plate, the, the lawn itself sits empty for much of the season. And uh, in previous years, we've, we've seen a decline in the number of tented events, which is what the uh, original purpose of the lawn ha has been for a number of years for the inn. So really the goal was to, to bring in some, some additional revenue from the spa. Um, and it's as simple as I, as I had explained a bit earlier in, uh, in the meeting uh, earlier this winter is you picture it's almost like two 10 by 10 pop-ups that you put in your backyard um, for a cookout. And when they're done, you know, at the end of the season. Now these are 10 by 10 aluminum welded frames um, that have canvas canopies and they're, there we go, they're secured um, to the ground themselves. So they're, 
they're they're definitely um, they're built to withstand wind um, and any of the conditions uh, that might pose in that that area of our hotel being in close proximity to the ocean. But um, very straightforward in nature. Um, no music, no power, no signage, no lighting, no running water. Um, pretty, pretty straightforward in, in our opinion in terms of what we're hoping to do. Um, and again, this was in, in January um, and so many things have changed since then. So in all likelihood, the inn would, would revisit if approved uh, potentially purchasing the structures not until the fall of this year with an install of spring 2021 where the economics have changed so much um, that I don't see the, there'll be demand for this amenity. Okay. Uh, well, are those decks uh, permanent or the decks temporary as well? That the, that you uh, everything, everything is temporary. Temporary. Um, it would be decommissioned at the conclusion of the season and stored with all of our outdoor furniture as we do um, in the winter. So there's no uh, pier foundations or anything under those decks. They're just boards placed on the ground, basically. Essentially, yeah. They'll be leveled, um, but they, they are uh, they'd be pressure treated with some Azec decking and um, and then would be removed. Um, at the end of conclusion okay. of each season. All right. Uh, so um, just so everybody knows, this is initially we're uh, discussing completeness. So does anyone have any questions on the issue of completeness of this application? Okay. Uh, Maureen, is anyone uh, teed up to make public comments on completeness. Let me check that. Okay. So we have 13 attendees right now. Michael Briggs has his hand up. Uh, no oh. one else. That's all no, right. Michael Don't worry Briggs about it. Have <laughs> so no one has their hand up. And if anyone wants to speak right now, they would need to raise their hand. No hand has been raised. Okay, seeing none, um, the public uh, the public comment on completeness is closed. Uh, does anybody uh, have any further questions, or would anybody like to make a motion on the issue of completeness? I'd like to make a motion. Fire away. Uh, motion for completeness, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Inn by the Sea located at 40 Bowery Beach Road for an amendment to the previously approved site plan to install two seasonal 10 foot by 10 foot cabanas on the southeast corner lawn be deemed complete. In accordance with section 19-9-4C3, the planning board waives the submission of financial and technical capability information due to the limited size of the project. Do I have a second? Second. Peter, any questions or comments? Okay, please call a roll vote. Uh, Mr. Bedensky? Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Curry? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. And Mr. Shalott. Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Um, I don't. I don't think we need a sidewalk. Does anyone feel we no. need a sidewalk for this? No. 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 Okay. No. Great. Um, then I'm going to open the board again to a public hearing on the application. Maureen, is anybody teed up to make a public comment? We still have 13 attendees. None of them have raised their hand. Okay, then the public hearing is closed. Uh, board members, do you have any questions? Comments? No. Uh, uh, sorry, Carol Ann. 
I, this seems so straightforward. It just, I have no questions. Okay. Would someone like to make a motion? Uh, I'll make a motion. Thank you, Peter. Uh, <clears throat> motion for approval. Findings of fact. One, the by the Sea, located at 40 Bower Beach Road, is requesting an amendment to the previously approved site plan. <coughs> excuse me. To install two seasonal 10 foot by 10 foot cabanas on the southeast corner lawn, which required review for compliance with section 19 9 site plan regulations. Two, the N by the C site plans have been previously approved by the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board to be in compliance with the site plan regulations and findings and decisions of those approvals, which are not altered by the proposed amendments, remain in effect. Three, the Cabana's amendment reflect the natural capabilities of the site to support development. Four, the applicant has de uh, demonstrated adequate technical and financial ability to complete the project. Five, the application substantially complies with section 19-9 site plan regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the MBIC located at 40 Bower Beach Road for an amendment to the previously approved site plan to install two seasonal 10 foot by 10 foot cabanas on the southeast corner lawn be approved. Second. Carol Ann seconds. Any discussion? Uh, Maureen, please call a roll vote. Mr. Bedensky? Yes. Ms. Curry? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Huebner? Yes. Ms. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Sarbeck? Yes. And Mr. Shalott? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very um, much. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna just roll right along here while Maureen tees up the next plan. Uh, Okay, the next item on the agenda is the Doyle uh, Elizabeth Farm Subdivision Amendment. Ian and Gina Doyle are requesting an amendment to the previously approved Elizabeth Farm Subdivision to expand the building envelope for the lot located at 11 Coal Field Road, that's map U53-2C. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 1625 amendments to a previously approved subdivision. Uh, we'll begin by having the applicant present the proposed amendments, uh, followed by public comment period on completeness of the application. So who's here to uh, represent uh, the Doyle Farms, the Doyle Elizabeth be, Farms? Um, hang on just a moment. Okay. I believe that's Mr. Height. Yes. Uh, yeah. just need to. Great. So everyone can hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Great. Yeah, I. I'm not on Zoom. I, I just dialed in on my office phone. Okay. So you won't be able to see me. Uh, so I am um, presenting this um, this proposed amendment uh, on behalf of Ian and Gina Doyle uh, for a uh, approximately 600 square foot addition, uh, which would uh, originally have landed outside of the building the buildable envelope so I have um, proposed extending that out as you can see the hatched area on that that sketch uh, which would give more than enough room for for construction for staging and all of that um, this isn't this is again a sketch it's really relatively to scale um, it wouldn't it wouldn't come much further out into that hatched area, the, re the red portion of, uh, of addition. Um, I didn't see any impact. Essentially, that would be built on what is existing lawn and a portion of paved 
area. Uh, I didn't see any wetlands, uh, any evidence of impacting anything environmentally. Um, uh, that, that's it. It's pretty straightforward. Okay. Um, any quick questions for Mr. Height? Uh, Maureen, is anybody out there uh, have their hands up for public comment? Let me check. I should Maureen. say we will open the meeting to public comment before I ask you that. So we have 13 attendees and nobody has their hand up? Great. Okay, then the public comment period is closed. Um, do any of you have questions on the issue of completeness? Nope. Great. Okay. Would someone like to make a motion? I'll make a motion, Joe. Okay. Motion for completeness. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Ian and Gina Doyle for an amendment to the previously approved Elizabeth Farm subdivision to expand the building envelope for a lot located at 11 Coalfield Road be deemed complete. Do I have a second? I'll second. Um, Maureen, please call a roll call vote. That would be Mr. Bedensky? Yes. Mr. Curry? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Hubner? Yes. Ms. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Starbeck? Yes. And Mr. Shalott? Yeah. Motion passes. Um, okay, does anyone have any questions on, uh, well, hold on, sorry, jumping ahead of myself. Does anybody feel need for site walk? No. 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 Okay. I'm opening the meeting to a public hearing. Is there anyone raising their hand wishing to make a comment on the application? We still have 13 attendees and no hands are raised. Okay, public hearing is closed. Um, does anybody have any questions on the application? No, again, this seems pretty straightforward. All right, I have one. Uh, Maureen, in terms of how uh, Mr. Height has defined the additional area of the envelope, um, so the A's ref reference existing building area, so they can be found. Uh, it seems like he needs to make it clear that the new boundary is exactly parallel to the existing and that there's, because he hasn't, I mean, it seems like that, that would define it adequately for a uh, surveyor to lay it out if needed. Well, as you can, hopefully can see right here, he's dimensioned out the expansion at 45 feet. I see Which that. I had asked him, and I guess if you would be satisfied that either there'd be a note on the plan that said it's, you know, it's an, a 45 foot, distance from the original approved building well, the, uh, it, Yeah, the offset has to be parallel or else it's not defined, right? That it could be right. could narrow at one end or get wider. I mean, it, so, so we it's could pretty put obvious a, from the drawing that the intent is that it's parallel. I think it just should be shown graphically. You could put a, a condition on any potential approval that's that is the intent is to move the building envelope the let's see that's the westerly boundary 45 feet to the, the to the west to the east excuse me for the easterly okay. boundary 45 feet to the east yeah not exactly right but because it's 45 feet along the rear line, but that line's not perpendicular. If it was perpendicular, Correct. it would be 45 feet, but it's whatever the offset is, which is actually not, you, you have to derive it mathematically. Do you understand what I'm saying, Steve? I, I do, I, I do. Uh, it's, that's a very good point. I can annotate it that way. Um, 
Yeah, th- this is more diagrammatic. Um, yeah. When I do, yeah. So when I do the house plans, I will, I will come right, up with. Right, but a, we're a not going to see the house plan. plans. We're just approving the okay. change to the envelope. Yep. So I just want to make okay. sure it's geometrically defined. So how would you define that, Joe? I just show that that line is parallel. There's a bunch of ways you could do it. But if we want to put it into a condition, how would we state it? Uh, you could say the new side offset line is parallel to the existing. Let me hold on, I'll wordsmith that. Uh, the condition is that the new eastern uh, building envelope line is parallel to the existing building line at a dimension as shown on the plan. Does that make sense to everyone? It's a very small point, I have to mm-hmm. say. But... Well, but it's something that could mess somebody up in the future. Is that a, you, is yep, that no, okay that, that makes sense. Mind? I think if we, as long as we just make it clear that the line is parallel on the All right. Okay. Any yep. other items? Um, I'll, I'll write the note uh, and then add it at the end as a would anybody like to make a motion? I can do it. Oh, actually. Okay. Andrew, yes. Uh, Andrew. One thing that um, might actually be somewhat confusing is, and I'm realizing now this is in the, uh, where it's showing the, the expanded building envelope, there's what I think is intended to be a legend that says proposed expanded building area, but that might actually be read as like, you have an additional little spot that could be a <laughs> um, sort of upper right. I don't know if you're following me. Oh, I see. You might want to put it out and, and, and call it out as a, put it in a legend area or something so it doesn't look like there's yet another area of expansion. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yep, exactly. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, it should have been outside of it, um, outside of the because otherwise it looks like a little partial plan. Right. Yep. yep. That's it. Thanks. Okay. Okay, Carol Ann, do you want to go ahead? Okay. I'm just writing myself a little scribble here. All right. Um, findings of fact: Ian and Gina Doyle are requesting an amendment to the previously approved. Elizabeth Farm subdivision to expand the building envelope to the lot located at 11 Coalfield Road, U532C, which requires review for compliance with section 16-2-5 amendments to a previously approved subdivision. Two, the Elizabeth Farm subdivision has been previously approved by the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board to be in compliance with the subdivision ordinance and the findings and the decisions of those approvals which are not altered by the proposed amendments remain in effect. The subdivision amendment will not result in undue water pollution and the subdivision amendment is not located within a hundred year flood plain. Soils will support the proposed use. The slopes of land and proximity of streams and state and local water resource rules and regulations will not be compromised by the project. The subdivision amendment is compatible with the applicable provisions of the comprehensive plan and town ordinances. The expanded building envelope will be provided with access to utilities. The subdivision amendment substantially complies with the requirements of section 16-3-3-1, excuse me, uh, subdivision standard. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of 
Ian and Gina Doyle for an amendment to the previously approved Elizabeth Farm subdivision to expand the building envelope for the lot located 11 Coalfield Road be approved with the following conditions. The definition or a note to be added. I can in add that, Caroline. I have a, I wrote one if you want. Okay, you go put it in there. First, uh, I think we have to have a second before I do and add a friendly. Okay, and well. I'm looking at Maureen. Yes, there's two people looking at okay. you. But. You want me to just skip that and you can put the note in? Okay. I'm also going to put a note in that the legend uh, showing the how the proposed expanded build, buildable area is designated be moved outside of the lot and to a legend square. Okay. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Okay, more, uh, Carol Ann, can I add a condition? You may. All right, I'd like to add the condition as follows. The new eastern building envelope line shall be offset parallel to the existing eastern building envelope line. That's it. That's okay with me. Is it okay with the second? Mm, yes. Okay. Uh, Maureen, please take a roll call vote. Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Mr. Shalott. Yes. The motion passes. Thank you very much, Mr. Height. Um, and we will uh, Thank on. you all. Could I, yep, could I, I just note Maureen. that this plan will also need to be signed by the planning board. So Mr. Hyde, if you could get it to me as soon as possible, we can have both the plans the board needs to be signed at the same time. Okay, we will do. Yep, that, that's uh, pretty simple. Yeah, I'll take care of that uh, right away. Okay. All right, thank, thank you everyone for your time. Have a good evening. You too. Okay, bye. All right, the next item on our agenda uh, is the 18 Ledgewood Lane Private Access Way Permit. James Gray is requesting a private access way permit for the lot located at 18 Ledgewood to cure a road frontage deficiency and make the lot buildable. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 1979 private access ways. Okay, we'll begin with the applicant introducing the project. And then um, the first item will be uh, to weigh in on the completeness of the application. So Maureen, you're uh, switching over here. Yes, and I believe what we wanna do um, is if Todd is okay with this, we can make Todd the host and he can run his own plans. Or Mr. Gray the host and he can run his own plans. Okay. Who wants to do it? Uh, is that Courtney? Todd, can you hear us? Oh, yes. Uh, yes, I'm on now. Can you hear me? Yep, we yes. can hear you, Todd. Todd. Would you like to host your portion of the meeting and control uploading your own plans? Uh, no, I would, it would probably be easier if you did that. That's fine, all right. <clears throat> I, I don't even have the PDF on my uh, computer, so. Thought I'd give you that option. Yeah, it should be fairly straightforward if you just go to the third sheet. You're just going to give me a moment. <clears throat> so you have um, a draw drawing set. Is that what you would like up? Uh, sure. Yeah. You can put it to the, there's three drawings in the set.
third sheet would be fine. Um, I want to make a comment here that uh, I noticed uh, you guys uh, um, put put these in the system two ways: one in each as individual sheets, and one as a combined set of drawings and a combined set of all the uh, sheets. And I think that's a lot easier to deal with uh, when you're downloading and going through all of these. Um, something, I don't know if we want to consider, can, we can consider that later. Is that going to work for you, Todd? You're not seeing it yet. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm still seeing uh, Elizabeth Barnes. This might still be loading in. Let's see. <clears throat> you seeing it now? Yeah. Yeah. Is that going to do it for you, Todd? Yeah, that's fine. That's the that's the second sheet out of the three. That that's fine to start the conversation. Okay. The... Do you want to start your presentation? Yeah. So Todd Gammon, Blaze Civil Engineers, uh, representing James Gray on a private way, private access way permit. Um, we are at Map U thirty six lot sixty four. If you go down Broad Cove Road, it's the uh, we're on Ledgewood Lane at the end, uh, one of the last lots uh, to the left at the end of the cul-de-sac. Um, we're hoping to get completeness and final approval. One meeting we had a prior workshop with the planning board uh, a month ago. Uh, one of the reasons for the private access way is we have a, a non-conforming uh, street frontage uh, within the residence A R A district. Uh, so that's essentially why we're here. Um, the lot is uh, has been assigned an address of 18 Ledgewood Lane. It's 19,600 square feet. And we've done a, for the standards in the private access way, we've done a 30 foot wide access way. It's about 25 feet long to get up to the uh, building setback line, which is shown on that drawing. Wayne Wood, our surveyor, uh, did the boundary survey, which you're looking at, and we also laid out the, uh, the meeting bounds for the access way. We have uh, sanitary sewer and public sewer, public water um, in, the, in the street. Also, utility pole is adjacent to the lot. Um, we're proposing a 14 foot wide paved driveway with two foot grass on gravel shoulders on each side up to the building setback line. Uh, the driveway will be cross sloped to uh, sheet the stormwater into the grass instead of directly out into the road. And we've asked for a waiver which we obtained from the fire chief on not having the an emergency turnaround required. Um, everything else is fairly simple. We had, um, there was a few comments from Steve Harding's peer review letter uh, that I spoke to him about. One of the comments was wondering if uh, the neighbors actually number one spoon drift, which is a couple lots over, if their uh, sewer pipe, which heads to Ledgewood Lane, whether that encroached onto our property, we had that uh, TV last week and had Bob Malley take a look and we, we determined that there was no encroachment so there was no easement necessary that everything on this plan still uh, still applies. Uh, there was one comment from Steve Harding about just reversing instead of going to the east with the super elevation of the driveway going to the west uh, to follow the downgrade <clears throat> of Ledgewood Lane. Uh, which we can easily make that change. Uh, there was another comment on putting showing the width of the driveway uh, 
on the plan, which he said he missed. We, we actually do show that on the plan, as you can see right in the middle, is 14 feet wide and the two foot grass on gravel. Um, his last comment was a 20 foot radius. If you can see the radii that extend uh, off the, ed the current edge of pavement, those are currently five foot radiuses. It does call out for 20. I did talk to Steve about that. That's actually adds quite a bit of impervious area um, and additional stormwater flow out into the road. So he was in agreement that he was content with what we're showing there. He just wanted to call out what was in the, uh, in the requirements. So we'd ask that you consider um, not requiring us to do the 20 foot. It's, it feels a little unnecessary on this property. Um, we also did propose some fencing to the rear of the parcel. Uh, which in conversations with the neighbor, I know Jim Gray's on tonight and he wanted to speak to that. He's had conversations with the neighbors and I know the neighbor to the, uh, I believe it's the, the morals and the, uh, the neighbor to the West, uh, Mr. Cloutier wrote a letter and they both, uh, made comments on the requirement for a landscape buffer. Um, and he did meet with the neighbor to the rear, Mr. Keenan, who wrote an email. I believe it was presented to the board. And uh, the applicant, Jim Gray, did meet with him. He's decided not to put in, per his request, the fence. So we are gonna do all uh, natural landscaped uh, buffering with uh, evergreen trees. And I'll let maybe Jim speak to that as to his conversations with the neighbors. Other than that, um, happy to take any questions, I guess. Well, the, yeah, the, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, the uh, Steve Harding's letter regarding the uh, runoff in the driveway spoke of constructing a swale down where the driveway met the street. And I didn't see anything in the drawings that suggest what that swale would look like. It's, um, is that um, something that you were gonna add or is this just sort of a rough concept that you would incorporate into the, into the paving? Yeah, so that comment was, um, was made post this submission and he just wanted us to super elevate. If you can see it's, if you're looking, if you're standing in Ledgewood, looking up the driveway, the uh, the stormwater will pitch to the right. He requested that we pitch it to the left, which is fine, and add a spot grade in the grass, showing a little bit of a swale, just showing that it stays in the grass. And that's what we're going to update with the revised set post the meeting. And it was a, he agreed it was a it was a minor thing, but we thought it was uh, um, a good comment to, to just switch to the other side. You know, I took his point to be creating a swale that, <coughs> pardon me, uh, traverse the width of the driveway. Is that, is that not what you have in mind? Yeah, no, we didn't want to put like a belly in the beginning of the driveway. No, we're actually cross sloping the whole driveway. We're going to be cross sloping that to the left. The full 14 feet will go right into the grass and then it's going to drop down along the grass and we followed the topo down towards that SMH, the sewer manhole rim. And we're going to be, I'm going to put one spot grade in the grass and, and it's going to be able to uh, follow along the, the edge of pavement in the grass uh, down Ledgewood. There shouldn't be much flow at all, but uh, I was in agreement to, to add some of those spots. They're going to put a little belly in the grass just to encourage that flow to go continue to the west. Okay, any other comments on completeness? or questions, I should say. I have a question. Uh, I'm sorry, did somebody else have a question? Okay. Um, are you going to, how are you planning to indicate uh, landscaping that you're going to add? Well, we did put it on both this and the survey plan. If you can look just above there, it says privacy fence. Yeah. Uh, hey, Jim had given me a, a spec 
uh, fence that he thought he might put to the rear, and I showed the location of the fencing. Um, we've decided to not install that fence, so we're going to call out on the plan. If you can see, there's another note, maintain five-foot vegetated buffer along property lines in areas without fencing. We're going to remove the fencing piece and, and maintain that vegetated buffer note, except we're going to be more detailed in terms of the spacing. Maureen's asked for an evergreen um, 15 feet on center, which Jim's agreed to. Okay. Um, all right. Then uh, if nobody has any questions, let's go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Maureen. Hi. I just wanted, I w thank you. I wanted to follow up on the note. It, it's just that if the board is going to have something approved that's different than what's on the plan, you need to put a condition on it. And the condition needs to be specific enough so that staff isn't making, you know, wild interpretations. So that's why in the memo that I provided you, I suggested, for example, we could take an evergreen, I think it was six to seven feet at the yeah. time of planting, 15 feet off center. If the applicant has an alternative proposal that is that, that level of specificity, definitely it would be appropriate to talk about that. But otherwise, at least I think what I've given you is, is specific enough if you're interested in adding an evergreen in, in a vegetative buffer in place of or to supplement what's already there. All right. Well, it sounds like Todd, what Todd said was exactly what's written here, right? Am yeah. I right, Todd? Yes. And I don't know if Jim wanted to speak tonight, but I know he did have discussion with the neighbors. And there is quite a bit of, uh, for instance, between his parcel and Cludiers to the west, uh, there's already quite a bit of natural buffer. So um, he wanted to have the ability to add the proposed evergreens as, okay. necessary, as necessary, I guess. Well, this is pretty specific, six to seven feet, 15 feet on center where there's no fence. All right, so let's, um, just open this up for public hearing on completeness. Does anybody um, wish? Joe, I believe Maureen. Mr. Gray would like to speak and as the applicant. I'm sorry, Mr. Thank Gray. You, Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I'd just like to make a few comments. I, I wrote a, a quick note to Maureen earlier. I think she forwarded it to the board that yes, we <clears throat> we have agreed that the Keenans, I think we're right that uh, um, large white vinyl fence would be you know out of character but um, so therefore we are proposing to do the the evergreen trees every 15 feet apart along the back and along the the uh, left hand boundary up to where the is it not believe so, Beasley's property is and I <clears throat> would like to request a variance on the, the adding the other evergreens on both the left, the remainder of the left side of the property and on the right side of the property. There is uh, a fair amount of vegetation that I was able to leave on the right side. And I tried to leave it on the left, but there just is nothing there. However, I've talked with both neighbors the, uh, and both of them <clears throat> have agreed that that buffer is, is unnecessary and they've expressed that they're are not concerned with the approval of a waiver of it. All right, so I just to be clear, what your drawing shows is fence along the back property line, along about a uh, little less than a quarter of the right-hand property line and maybe a third of the left-hand property line. That, <laughs> that fence, is that what you're talking about getting rid of? Well, I'm, <clears throat> I'm talking about eliminating the fence. All together. All together. And okay. putting, uh, establishing the evergreen buffer along the back and that third of the left-hand property, but probably not along that short piece on the right-hand side because there's that's all wooded. The initial purpose for the fence was not just a buffering, but it was also to establish a a way to uh, keep my our small Bichon dog in the backyard. <laughs> so we really don't need the, the buffering on the right hand back corner.
All right, well, um, let me open it up to, let me open the meeting up to public comment and because it seems we have enough here uh, to discuss this at least. Uh, so is there anybody, <coughs> uh, Maureen, you look like you're, Yes, so um, we do have 10 attendees and Russ Keenan has his hand up, so I'm gonna make his uh, mic live. Okay. And then um, Mr. Keenan, make sure your, your mic is live and you give us your name sure. and address. Sure, um, can you hear me, Maureen? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I'm Russ Keenan at Three Spoon Riff Lane. So I'm the owner of, um, well, I live in close proximity to uh, Mr. Gray's property. And I also own the property behind there. And I just wanted to mention that, um, I wrote this in my note too, that that is um, incorrect on the site plan. And I didn't wanna have this hold up the proceeding, but it should be correct. I think the, um, <coughs> or had used the wrong map. It used one for Shore Acres. And he should have um, identified it as um, parcel R03-25 rather than U-1211. So I just, um, you know, uh, a clerical error there. And, um, and I wanted to say that um, Mr. Gray met with my wife. I was not home at the time. Um, and uh, so we, we've come to agreement. I really appreciate his willingness to take our comments about the fencing and uh, we're all fine with, uh, with the plan as, as he's modified it. And, uh, Welcome them to the neighborhood. <laughs> okay, thank you. Are there any other comments, Maureen? Um, I've got a ten, 10 attendees. Uh, we do have another person with their hand up. Uh, please make sure you identify yourself and you have to turn your microphone on. There you go. Yes, hi, um, I'm uh, Mary Steidel. I'm also um, a neighbor and I just wanted to check to see with the other piece of property that has recently sold, what the access to that property, it's listed as spoon drift. And I just wanted to confirm that the way that people will access that property is also, is, is going to be on spoon drift and not off of Ledgewood. M Joe, for the chair. Yes, Maureen. Ms. Steindl, we need your address. Um, 15 Ledgewood. Thank you. So uh, if you're asking about a property that's not this property, I would suggest you email or call me tomorrow morning and we can go over that with you. Okay, but is this being voted on now though? Well, the only, the only property under discussion for, by the planning board is 18 Ledgewood. The other lot is not in front of the planning board. And okay. I, my understanding is it's the other lot you're asking about it. Am I well, correct? If we're talking about taking what I guess what I'm just wondering, it's they're listed as spoon drift, but we're now accessing and making amendments um, to the access. I was just curious if there's, you know, what's going on with this other piece of property. So, because that's a, a very busy walking area back and forth to Shore Acres, lots of people are through there. And I'm just curious to see if we're about to put a lot of traffic into there. So again, this is the only lot that's in front of the planning board. And yeah, there's nothing we can do. We can't really answer that. Can, can, do you know if, if that other, if anything has already been decided about that other lot? And, and that's why I'm suggesting that you call me tomorrow and I will make sure I understand which lot you're talking about and I'll see what I can find in our office on information. Okay, thank you. Okay, Maureen, are there any other items? I'm sorry, are there any other people wishing to comment? Um, nope, that's it. Okay, the public hearing on completeness is closed. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments? Um, Carol Ann? 
do we put conditions on completeness? We've talked about a couple things that do not show up on the plan that are going No, to but I think that we can judge something complete even if the information is perhaps not correct or can be amended. I don't, I mean, I agree. I, I think where you're headed is that it's not real clear what's going on with the trees, where they're going to be, how many. Um, but I don't think that uh, negates it being complete. You want a motion? I'd love a motion. I like doing the short ones. I'll leave the long ones for John. <laughs> Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Motion for completeness. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of James Gray for a private access way permit for the lot located at 18 Ledgewood be to cure, to cure a road frontage deficiency and make the lot buildable be deemed complete. Do I have a second? Second. Any questions or comments? Maureen, please take a roll call vote. Certainly. Uh, Mr. Bedensky? Yes. Mr. Curry? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Hubner? Yes. Ms. George? Yes. Maureen, your computer froze on us, but I imagine you were. <coughs> Well, I'm getting a message that my internet connection is unstable. <laughs> well, at least it's your internet connection. Yeah, I don't think it is. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Starbeck. Yes. And Mr. Shalott. Yes. Thank uh, you. The motion is passes. The application is deemed complete. Um, does anybody feel any need for a site visit? No. No. Any? Maureen. I actually was out at the site two days ago and took a picture, and I'm happy to bring it up if you want to see it. Yeah, that would be good. Well, let's hold on. Hold on one second. Um, uh, Can I just? Yeah, okay. Let's let's take a. I, it seems to me the main issue in my mind is the number and location of the trees that that just be clarified so that we can add a note that defines it adequately. Um, can I, can and, I just be heard? Yes. So this is still a application per, for a private access permit and the reason it's we need to have a private or I'm sure I'm let me just rephrase that, that the applicant needs a private access permit is because the old uh, subdivision plan that was created in the, uh, in the 60s doesn't uphold to the standards that we're now at. Yes. And that's why we are looking at this. This is very similar to the lot that we saw over on Silva Drive which was the same exact situation where there was a buildable lot, except that the road frontage didn't meet the requirement that is now necessary. And we didn't do a site walk there. And so I'm not really looking too much. To, I, this is very similar to me um, with regards to the, what we looked at on Silver Drive. And so to me, I don't think we need to see for the purposes of a private access permit um, that I do really don't need to see too much with regards to what they're going to be doing um, with the trees uh, in the back of the lot because it doesn't have anything to do with the private access permit. Um, I'm very happy to hear that they are already talking to their future neighbors and seems like they're going to be welcome into the neighborhood but for the purposes of the private access permit um, I don't see my personal view is I don't see the need for a sidewalk. Okay. Right. Um, anybody else? Maureen, can you go ahead, you want to go ahead and bring up the pictures that you wanted to show us? I'm working on it right now. Okay. Yeah. 
I can't help you right now. Mm -hmm. I can't help you right now. Joe, while she's doing that. Yes. My thing here, and I think it's what you, you're you also thinking about, is how do we properly represent this discussion with the trees? Yeah. As far as the condition of approval. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Can you all see this now? Yep. Yeah. So um, just to be clear, the applicant asked for permission to begin clearing. He had an opportunity to do it and the board had to cancel the March meeting because of our COVID event. And uh, he got permission from the code officer and I because what he proposed to do is what he could have done without getting a private access way permit. And I, I took this picture, as you can see, the tree line is running this way, but this is the property line right here, and it goes right through to that point. So um, once you get past um, the house that's to the east, there, there are existing trees that have been preserved. Mm -hmm. And what you have here is what is not that unusual, where the abutter, you know, did a little bit more landscaping than their property line supported. Hmm. Interesting. That's along this house is to the east of the lot. Right. I'm standing. I'm. I've got. I've got Ledgewood the and the cul-de-sac right behind me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the the other side. I didn't get a picture on the other side, but there, it's the same conditions where you've got this. You do have trees that, that are along the property line. So it's just the back property, back property line that needs a vegetated buffer. Well, the board can make a determination. I mean, the, the standard is that the, a buffer has to be provided. Um, the applicant had originally talked about preserving five feet. Uh, I was a little curious as whether there was actually any vegetation in the five foot strip, which is why I went <laughs> out there. Now the applicant is had proposed a fence. If they were, and, and I know you were talking about how to, the mechanics of turning the fence into um, evergreens, I think it would be fairly, if you're, if you're interested, it would be fairly easy to write a condition that says that the area that is shown as fencing would be replaced with a row of evergreens, six to seven feet at the time of planting, 15 feet on the center. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, mm. got it. It should be shaded too. And and I think, Mr. Gray, that kind of reflected what you wanted to do. Um, Mr. Gray, is his, his hand up, Joe? Can I? Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, yes. Sorry, Mr. Gray, go ahead. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Maureen, that is, that is correct. The exception that in the very back part of the line that we have on the screen uh, is all heavily wooded already, so there'd be no point in putting evergreens in that particular area. But all the way across the back and down that section of the other side, yes. I'd like to, to address it. Yes, this is the property line that does go across the Morals property. Uh, but I, that is not, <clears throat> uh, our house is going to be located farther back, so that doesn't really impact me. And uh, I don't see any reason to delineate that line by putting trees along it. And I think it would just impact the Morals and make just that the trees would be growing across the front of the yard. So, um, so if we were to <coughs> word it as the fence along the west side and nor the rear side would be replaced with trees planted six to seven feet on center, and no, no trees, no trees planted on the eastern. Portion. And no fence. And no fence. And no fence. No offense. No fence. Yeah. That that sounds like something that's specific enough for our needs. Yes. Okay. Um. So that takes care of that. Does anyone have any other? Uh, can I make one more comment? Sure. 
Um, I think your motion said the trees would be six to seven feet apart, but I think there should be six to seven feet high and 15 Oh, feet. I'm sorry. Yes, you're yeah. correct. Yeah. All right. So does anybody want to make a motion? <laughs> Jim? Yeah. Um, motion for approval. Well, uh, findings of fact. Could I interrupt? Yes. Did you hold a public hearing? I know you had a public comment. Oh, period no, I'm sorry. Thank you, Maureen. Okay. Uh, the meeting is now open to a public hearing. Is there anybody wishing to comment on the application? And I'm looking at our attendees and no one has their hand up. Okay, the uh, meeting is closed to public hearing and Jim, please proceed. Um, motion for approval, findings of fact one, James Gray is requesting a private access way permit for the lot located at 18 Ledwood to cure a road frontage deficiency and make the lot buildable, which requires review for compliance with section 19-7-9 private access ways. Two. The pro proposed lot shall be improved with only one dwelling unit and related accessory buildings and uses. Three, the private access way shall be located within a dedicated right of way having a width of uh, uh, 30 feet. Does that still apply or you got the 14 feet? I know. That's the 30 driveway. feet is the width of the right of way. 14 is the width of the traveled way. Okay. okay. Four, the sub base shall be constructed with gravel meeting it. MDOT spec 703.06 type D with a depth of at least 15 inches and having a width of at least 18 feet. Uh, five, the travel way shall be constructed with a minimum of three inches of crushed gravel, having a width of at least 14 feet with a remaining width of gravel, gravel base loamed and seated. Six, the access way shall be paved with three inches of asphalt paving. The minimum, minimum grade within the first 50 feet of the edge of street paving shall not exceed 5%. Pavement radius at the intersection of the street shall be five feet. Is, I, is that right? I mean, it's not 20 feet. Yep. Yeah, we're, we're requesting five on that. And just to be clear, the requirement is two inches of asphalt, not three. And that's what we've shown in the detail. Ah, okay. Two inches of asphalt paving. Uh, seven, gutter drainage along the street shall be allowed to sheet across the face of the intersection and the proposed design will keep drainage from the private access way from running into the public street. Eight, uh, the fire chief uh, is recommended that a turnaround not be, oh yeah, that the construction of a turnaround be waived in favor of using Ledgewood Lane as a turnaround. <laughs> Nine, the access way is located so that site distance conforms to the requirements of the subdivision ordinance. 10, the private access way shall serve only one lot. 11, the private, no, the planning board has not reduced the requirements of section 19-7-9 D4 to a lesser standard. 12. That's not correct. Okay, so are we, should I delete number 11? Um, I, is it all right if I speak in the middle of a motion? Yes, no. Um, I would, I would say that except for the radius standard. So leave okay. 11 the way it is at the end, put a comma and say, except for the radius standard. To a lesser standard comma, except for the radius standard. 12, adequate disposal of sewage shall be provided as evidenced by connection to the public sewerage system. 13, a building envelope is depicted wherein the house and accessory buildings will be located on the lot, demonstrating conformance with the setback requirements of the district in which it is located and any natural constraints and that the house site will be buffered from abutting residential properties subject to the additional plantings and fencing to be provided. 14, the application substantially complies with section 19-7-9 private access ways and section 19-8-3 resource protection regulations. 
Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of James Gray for a private access way permit for the lot located at 18 Ledgewood to cure a road frontage deficiency and make the lot buildable be approved, subject to the following conditions. That the plans be revised to address the comments of the town engineer in his letter dated April 15th, 2020. Two, that the building envelope be labeled on the plan. A note shall be added to the plan that all principal and accessory structures must be located within the building envelope. Three, um, that the, uh, I mean, I'm winging this one, that the fence currently shown on the plans be deleted and uh, existing vegetation buffers on the east and west sides remain and evergreen trees of a size of six to seven feet in height be provided uh, space 15 feet apart uh, plus or minus on the rear lot. Does that sound like what we discussed? On the rear, Maureen? On the on side, the, too. The north I side? It was the, the fence be deleted. And yeah. That the, um, that the late book and that the planting that you described perfectly would be placed uh, where fencing is shown on the sidelines. Okay. So no, no buffer on the back line. Okay. Um, I'll try this again. Uh, yeah. That yeah. the the fence currently shown, the new fence currently shown on the plan be deleted and uh, the existing vegetation, vegetative buffering on the east and west sides remain and there be no vegetative buffering on the north lot line. Does that sound right? Okay, so we need to add one more thing. Yeah. That the, that's on, that the, let's see, each side remain, and then I put a period, a okay. evergreen buffer be planted in place of the fencing on the sidelines. And period, the evergreen buffer shall be six to seven foot tall evergreens planted 15 feet apart. Okay, Hiromi, what she said. <laughs> <laughs> Is that okay, Hiromi? I can't tell if she's nodding yes or I can't. She's, she she's nodding yes. Okay, <laughs> all right. Four, that there be no issuance of a building permit until the plans have been revised to address the above conditions and the plan has been signed by the planning board and recorded with with the road maintenance agreement in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. Do we have a second? Second. Carol Ann. Okay. Andrew, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I don't I don't think honestly that what was described for the planting of the buffer was what the applicant was suggesting not to like just confuse matters more. As I understand what he said, where the fence line is now, which is, and it's not even really west, north and south, because if you look at the north arrow, it's pointing actually diagonally across the page, but let's call it the, the, the back lot line, which is the, basically the shortest one not on the street, that would be entirely planted with the six to seven foot planting 15 feet on center. And then the one looking towards the backside on the left where the fence is, so that's the longest side stretch of fence. But that on the other side, so that'd be the right rear, would not have any plantings because it has sufficient natural buffer. That's how I understood it. Maybe I'm getting yeah, this correct. That was planting. Yeah, that's how I understood it as well. Yeah, that's kind of how I understood it. Quirky, <laughs> is that what you understood? Mr. Gray, if you want to unmute your microphone. I'm sorry, I thought it was. Yes, that is the way uh, I was proposing. 
So, but isn't the simple way to say it that the plantings would be in the westerly and northerly uh, sides of the property in lieu of the fence shown? Yes. And, and the fence would not be on the easterly side. Okay. That seems more accurate to me. <laughs> Thanks. It is. Yeah, I didn't think an attorney could make something so succinct. I thought it would have to be longer. <laughs> All right. So are we changing that? Yes, we are. It's okay with me. All right, Maureen, would you like to call a roll call vote? Certainly. Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. And Mr. Chalot. Yes. Okay, the motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you, people. Thank you. All right. Let me just get set up here for the next guy. Okay, the next item on the agenda is 287 Ocean House Road Site Plan. Michael Friedland, doing business as Yam Yams LLC, is requesting site plan review to operate a retail lumber store with do-it-yourself classes in the existing 1,980-square-foot uh, 1, building located at 287 Ocean House Road. The application will be reviewed for compliance with Section 19.9 Site Plan Regulations and Section 19.9.4 Town Center Zoning District. Uh, we'll begin with the uh, applicant introducing the project, um, and then we will open the meeting to public comment on completeness of the application. Um, so. I don't know who's here to speak on behalf of uh, this application. I'm uh, Mr. Friedland is here and someone from Northeast Civil Solutions is here. And okay. I am working to promote them to panelists. All right. Which doesn't seem to be taking and I'm gonna need another moment. Okay, that worked. I think, um, the internet's a little burdened. There are lots of Zoom happy hours going on. Not enough. Let's see. All right. So Northeast Civil, can you hear me? Can you turn your mm -hmm. mic on? Yes, I can hear you. This is Jim Fisher. All right. So I've tried to promote okay? you to panelist. Have you accepted that? Can you hear me okay, Maureen? Right, I've tried to, the question is, do you want to be able to present your own drawings or do you want me to present them for you? Uh, no, if you could put up the drawing, that would be great. <laughs> okay, so you just need to tell me which ones you want, when you want them. At this point, three of five would be great. That's the proposed site plan. All right, 
Those should be coming in now. Yep, that's great. Is this the one you want? Uh, the, uh, there you go, right there. G3 to 5, that's perfect. Thank you. Sure. Okay, are we all set? We are set. Outstanding. Um, thank you. This is Jim Fisher from Northeast Civil, and uh, we're back. We've been to the board a couple of times already regarding uh, the Lumbery, which is the uh, retail uh, um, uh, lumber establishment uh, store at uh, 287 Ocean House Road, which is also uh, map U2, or U22, lot 76. Uh, just as a quick uh, rehash of background, it is a one acre, approximately a one acre site, a little bit less. Uh, there are two access points, one from uh, Ocean House Road and one from Scott Dyer Road. There, we are proposing 22 parking spaces on the site right now. That's considerably fewer than uh, what was there originally. Uh, we're proposing to rehab the existing building as we had discussed last time. We are no longer at the request of the board or the suggestion of the board and uh, uh, Mr. Friedland. Um, we are no longer proposing a farmer's market. Uh, no food trucks and no music venue at this point. Uh, if anything like that does come back up, we'll certainly come to the board. But at this point in time, again, as the board early on the retail establishment uh, with a couple of small uh, classes or short classes that would be destined for people who want to learn how to use woodworking equipment um, with the lumber that is in the house. There's one building, there is one small out structure for the storage of the um, uh, wood, larger wooden area or larger wooden um, supplies. There is a, uh, and I'm just going, going through uh, Maureen's list and uh, a little bit back and forth with Steve Harding's list as well. Uh, there was a request for a uh, sidewalk easement along Scott Dyer Road. As the board may be aware, the town is redoing uh, Scott Dyer Road. They redid this particular section earlier last year. They replaced some of the existing concrete uh, Bitcoin sidewalk with a new sidewalk and granite curbing. Uh, we show where that curbing is. We don't label it specifically as granite, but that's off site. We can certainly do that. That's not an issue. And as far as the sidewalk easement is concerned, a portion of the sidewalk is actually uh, over in the, the corner near the intersection is actually onto the Locust property. It has been for decades. Uh, when the town redid it recently, they redid it in the same place. Uh, which is certainly fine with us as far as an easement is concerned. Uh, the town really has a prescriptive easement anyway, um, but we'd be happy to work with the town as far as making that real. That's not an issue for us. Also, as far as some of the comment, Marines comments are concerned, uh, there was a uh, um, interest about the VRAP program and the environmental action plan. You have the EAP or the environmental action plan as part of your packets. Uh, that was also submitted to the DEP along with everybody else, the DEP, full of great people trying really hard, mostly working from home, and we don't have that uh, VRAP program back yet. Although the VRAP program had been submitted uh, year, quite a number of years ago, very similarly to what we expect here. Uh, this is when we were here for uh, Jin Wang's project uh, back again several years ago. So we're uh, utilizing that same VRAP program uh, with some minor changes, and the minor changes are make it actually uh, less impactful Essentially, what we're looking at for that is uh, VRAP is a DEP issue. We can certainly deal with the, uh, the town, provide that to the town when we get that. Uh, but essentially, all we're really looking at as far as a VRAP is concerned is uh, taking up some of the pavement that was part of the uh, uh, overall parking lot for Cumberland, the old Cumberland Farms. And we're replacing that with the loam and seed and landscaping that you then see on this plan. Uh, toward that end, that's not a major component of the VRAP because we're not actually doing any major excavation. The only portions of excavation that we would be doing as far as that VRAP is concerned is uh, for landscaping and for anchoring the, uh, the small uh, outdoor storage shed, uh, which just goes down several feet into the ground. And again, the plantings as far as the root balls and that's it. So there's no other excavation that's uh, proposed on here. And the DEP has indicated that uh, with the original VRAP that we should be able to have that shortly. We just don't have it this evening. As far as traffic is concerned, the board uh, did request that we do a traffic assessment, which we did. Uh, that's also part of your packets. Uh, one of the, uh, the main components of that is that there really are no significant issues as far as traffic with the site is concerned. 
there is an identification by the traffic engineer that, uh, as we all know, that intersection of Scott Dyer, Ocean House, and Shore Road is unique. Uh, it is a, a relatively high crash site, primarily uh, from the, on the Shore Road side, the Cumberland, Har Cumberland Farms. So there's no issue as far as that is concerned. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay, sorry, I'm getting a bunch of hosts or a bunch of uh, prompts saying that uh, I've been on mute. Um, okay, so uh, Maureen had a question, I believe it was Maureen had a question about the three lanes that are coming uh, or providing access to Scott Dyer. Uh, that was, that, uh, the width of that uh, area was there before, we're not proposing to change it. One of the reasons that that was there before or is uh, three lanes wide as opposed to Ocean House is that there is a queue distance particularly when the schools are back in session uh, at those certain times of uh, in the morning and in the evening or in the late afternoon, uh, the queue distance along Scott Dyer up to Ocean House Road uh, tends to be a little bit short. Uh, given that, there's about uh, room for about nine to 10 vehicles. Uh, and subsequent to that, we don't want, when we're doing any exiting from the uh, access, from the, from the locus onto Scott Dyer Road for anybody who wants to turn left, toward the intersection, they've got a dedicated turn lane to do that. So anybody that's turning right toward the school um, and um, that area does not have to wait for them. Uh, that's the reason typically why we're leaving that as, uh, as three access lanes as far as that uh, traffic access. There was a question about landscaping uh, from the uh, trees from the approved list. We had previously put some old maples in there or some uh, um, fire maples in there, but uh, we replaced them with uh, sourwood trees that are on the approved list as far as the city or town's arborist is concerned. Uh, there was also a question about uh, parking. There was a suggestion that there are two wings, con low concrete wings that are kind of beat up uh, that are in front of the, uh, the actual store right now or the building. One of these concrete wings, this is where the sidewalks are along the front of the building. Uh, we're proposing to leave one of them there, albeit cut it down slightly. Uh, and then the one at the other end, we're proposing to get rid of that. Exactly. We're proposing to get rid of that one uh, primarily for ease of plowing. Uh, we've got another maintenance for the parking lot. I don't, the sidewalk will be extended to that extent, but we don't believe that the wing is really necessary toward that end. Uh, and that just uh, helps us out as far as that parking and maintenance is concerned. There were some questions about lighting and signage. Um, as far as the lighting is concerned, we do have a lighting plan. Uh, it does show in the lower left-hand corner of the plan near the access onto Scott Dyer Road. Uh, there is a uh, 0 0.7 candle uh, power, uh, a foot candle power uh, at the, uh, the boundary, and then it fades uh, right at the uh, edge of pavement to 0 0.5. Uh, that has to do, we talked to Sweeney Lighting, and that has to do with the orientation of the hood on the light in that area, and that can be adjusted minorly so that that's not an issue. Uh, there was also a question that I believe uh, Maureen or Steve had about the signage. Uh, it would be proposed to be uh, lighted signage. Um, we can have some further information for you on that on a separate issue as far as the signage is, is concerned, uh, but that's not really part of uh, what we're looking at uh, this evening. Uh, and then there was some the issue that we discussed last time about uh, street lighting along Ocean House Road. We understand that the town is going to be redoing it ostensibly sometime later this year. The other side of Ocean House, putting in a sidewalk and, and putting in some of the uh, the lighting, the old gaslight style light, lighting that's uh, in front of, um, of the police station, that area. Uh, that's great. If the town chooses to do that on our side, we think that's wonderful as well. Uh, but that is in the public right of way. It doesn't really have anything whatsoever to do with this particular project. And as we had discussed last time, there are four Cobra light, four utility poles with Cobra lights, three of which are in the immediate vicinity of the pavement of this area. Uh, so from a pure lighting standpoint, there's actually uh, more lighting in that area that would otherwise be required. And we're obviously not proposing to change any of that. That's DOT lighting. Uh, so given the other aesthetic lighting, that's fine as far as the posts are concerned, but that it's a pretty substantial expense to be able to put on a uh, small uh, entrepreneur for uh, this particular site. Uh, given that it's purely for aesthetic for the town and it's completely in the right of way. Uh, there are some other issues with the, uh, the architectural plans. Uh, we've dealt with the architect on that. Uh, he's got some further issues or some further uh, comments uh, that we can put on those architectural plans. Um, as far as overall completeness is concerned, I do believe that we meet all the criteria. As, me, as Maureen had indicated, uh, there are no incompletes. They're all either yes or partials. Uh, and as Joe mentioned last time, I think we, we um, touch base in the previous discussion tonight, 
Uh, I think we meet all of the criteria. We may need to revise some of that information. We're happy to do that, uh, pending whatever uh, comments the board may have. And toward that end, we're happy to answer any questions or address any comments. I believe uh, Mike Friedland is also online and he may want to speak to a few things as well. Thanks. Let me, I got to interrupt. Are you going to go through the architectural plans too? Uh, we can go through the architecturals if you like. We can certainly address some of those things. I'm not sure that Mike Backman, who's the architect, is actually online tonight. Um, I can address them to the extent that it's feasible. Uh, we're not the architects. You know much better about that than we do, Joe. Um, but uh, toward that end, we're happy to address it to the extent that you've got any questions. Well, they're in the packet. Yes. And they're required for completeness. Yes. I mean, we can. I think we've addressed all the issues. They may not be addressed to the extent that the board has questions or comments about any potential plan revisions, uh, but I think we've addressed all the issues as far as the architecture is concerned. I'd be happy to defer to you, Joe, on that one. All right, you can, you can continue. Um, that's essentially it as far as I'm concerned, unless you've got any, unless the board members have any specific questions or comments, um, and then we can get into uh, the site plan review after completeness if that pleases the board. And Mike may also want to chime in. Um, I don't see him on my screen, but uh, I believe he was there. Right, I'm, I'm here and, and if uh, anyone has questions regarding the business or the building or the site, I'd be happy to answer them. Joe, were um, you asking for an overview of the, of the structure? Yeah, I think you gotta, I think Maureen, can you put up the architectural plans, please? Yes. So either Mike or Jim, what I want you to do is just go through them and because this is a new application, right? Yes. So, I mean, the, the building is part of the town center standards. So we can't, if we don't see them, we can't, it's, there's no completeness here. Now they should be, those uh, should be part of your packets. No, I'm saying they have to be part of the presentation. Oh, that's fine. I mean, I'm ideally, you, ideally, you should be presenting them as to how they address the standards. Okay, there are the standards. Um, let's just hold on. Let's let's, let, let's let Maureen get them on the screen. Okay. So let's start with the elevation. Okay, this is the, the top elevation that you see is the rear of the building. Uh, that's pretty much going to stay exactly the way it is. Not really any issue there. There's no changes proposed toward that end. Um, the front of the building, just below that uh, the top elevation, that shows the uh, uh, Ocean House Road facade uh, facing Ocean House Road. Uh, as Mike had indicated last time, there is a, a proposed uh, a door that you see, which is the double door, which is uh, for uh, moving materials in and out, um, the substantial materials, the lumber, uh, for instance. And then there's the actual uh, pedestrian door for people who are coming in to just buy uh, lumber supplies, uh, minor hardware items, etc. This overall facade is uh, a little uh, about 51% of the uh, Fenestration with the windows, the doors, and the openings, et cetera, compared to the overall facade. Uh, so that uh, meets the majority of um, uh, over 50% of what we're looking for. The, uh, the end of the building, Marina, if you could move that up just a little bit. Hold on. Are you, those sky, those are skylights depicted on the roof. Can you go up to the, show the rear elevation as well? Those are skylights? Yes. Yes, I understand and it. Yes. Are, they're not there, right? They are not there, no. And then there's a whole little ridge assembly up on yes. the top of that. Are you removing it? Yes. Okay. Keep going. Okay, so this is the end facade that is basically facing nowhere, the, the end of the parking lot. 
there is a door there right now that is to be removed and those three windows are just going to be added for additional light. Uh, that lighting from the inside of the building will be falling on the, uh, the raised dais as it were, or the mezzanine level in the building. That's where the, uh, the instruction will take place. Uh, there will be several mechanical equipment, saws and lathes and what have you that are up in that area and it just adds some natural light to the, the area. Uh, the existing door that is there now will be removed. And then the lowest section you see is that which is um, facing Scott Dyer Road. Uh, that uh, Mike has asked, has sent the board a request for a, a waiver of the requirement to be able to have the complete uh, over 50% of the, uh, the windows and doors and fenestration added to that. Uh, this is essentially what we're looking at as far as the new door is concerned with the signage right next to it and then the uh, million uh, windows that are on the corner. Uh, what they're proposing right here is a, uh, you've got the figures specifically in your packets, but uh, they're approximately 40% uh, to 60%, where typically it would be around 50-50. And that 40% is the, um, the openings, the fenestration, the windows, the doors, et cetera, to uh, approximately 60% that is other. Uh, that is the, a quick explanation of the facades of what they look like based on their orientation. And what are the materials? The siding is going to be hemlock, this shiplap. Uh, it's hemlock shiplap that comes from Bradford, Maine. It's a mill. It's uh, called Parker Mill up in Bradford, Maine. Is, and, it, uh, all the is it really 10 inch high boards? No, they're not. They're six inch. Okay. And the then it's shingles in the top, painted shingles. Yeah, those are those are existing already, and we'll just paint them. Metal roof. Yes. Okay. Uh, can you go back to the front? Is that aluminum storefront for the new opening? Oh, for, um, the door itself. We actually we're looking at doors right now. We haven't settled on exactly which door we're going to use for the opening. Um, but is the, the glass, it looks like you're drawing aluminum storefront opening, like, is that um, what that is? The glass on either glass, side of the door? It's glass doors and it probably would be aluminum housing that, uh, that the glass doors are sitting in. So I'd say yes. Well, yeah, but it, are you showing glass on either side of the door? Yes. And above the door. Yes. Okay. All right. Keep going down. You can go go on down to the plan. Um, so I wasn't sure what the difference is between the two plans, but um, can you go to the next plan that has the dimensions on it? All right, so everybody sees there's two doors. There's actually now three doors in and out of this. Okay, next, uh, keep going. Oh, hold on, the building is a block building, right? Yes. Concrete block. Okay, keep going. And keep going. Okay. And I think that's it, right? Is there anything else? Oh, the shed. Okay. Everybody looked at the shed drawings, I take it. All right. Does anybody have any questions about the elevations not pertaining to the town center standards standards but what's there and what's being depicted i think you you needed to label everything but uh i think we'll we can take it without the labels for the moment is, is everybody clear andrew um a5 i was just trying to it's, it's, it's hard to look at these flat dimensional drawings. Th these are just showing interior windows. Is that what that's looking at? And a door looking into that teaching space? That's a cross section through the, through the building. So it's cut through 
I'm uh, sorry, Michael, you can answer if you want. Sure, that's the interior of the building. So it's gonna be um, a raised platform where underneath it could store lumber. And then you take the stairs up about um, what I have about four feet and the raised platform area is, will there be some woodworking tools and where the classes will be? So, the, okay, so that door is, the, um, trying, what's the door on the left? Yeah, the door on the left, that's interior. So it's a door leading into sort of the woodworking area. Okay, so, all right. So that is that is gonna be like sheet rock or walled or something on the interior as well. I probably would, it's probably all gonna be wood. Or wood, yep, okay. Yeah, I was just trying to figure, I was just trying to read this, I just a little bit hard. So the reason for elevating it though is primarily to, to provide storage underneath. Yeah, the, the ceilings are quite high. And so instead of having storage above the classroom, it just made more sense to have storage underneath where it's more accessible. Okay, thanks. All right, does anybody have any questions for Jim on uh, materials or items that they're yes. not sure of? Jonathan. Um, one of the questions I have is I know that the applicant asked for a waiver on the Scott Dyer building or side of the building with regards to what percentage of um, windows or openings that we could allow and they're asking for us to accept the 38%. The question I have, and I think this probably goes more towards Maureen, is that I didn't think that we were able to waive standards. We can waive parts of the sub or the um, site plan approval, but if something isn't compliant with what the town center zoning ordinances say, then that's an issue. That's correct. So they're asking for some, us to waive something that we cannot waive. Yeah, I, I don't think you can. So the, we actually, this kind of, that kind of goes beyond completeness. I think that we can say this, that we have enough information to decide that or not, and we could decide whether well, or not. I'm well, looking, Joe, I, I'd I, like to I, move. But Joe, there, this is my issue with that, is that there, if that side of the building, Scott Dyer's side, doesn't have what we need to see with regards to what that's going to look like, because they're not at the percentage of openings that they need um, that apply, that go with the standards. And if it, No, I don't agree. I, I don't think that a complete set of drawings has to show conformance to the standards. I think that a complete set of drawings has to show enough so that you can decide whether the standards are met. I mean, we modify designs after uh, an application is deemed complete all the time. And so I, I'd rather I'd rather save that for after. I mean, to me, I, th I think these drawings of the building are missing an enormous amount of information and pretty unprofessional, unprofessional, but I feel like there's actually enough information in them to start weighing whether uh, this thing meets the standards of the town center or not. I agree with Joe. So that's why I'm saying, you know, I'd like to make sure there's a lot of stuff not labeled. So if there's anything you're not sure of or you want more explanation of what it is, now's the time, you know, now's a great time to do that. Okay, then I'm going to ask with regards to that, if the applicant can tell us what the Scott Dyer side of the building is going to look like, given the fact that we, if what it's presented at is now does not go up to what the standards are. So what sort of changes are they going to make on the Scott Dyer side that will be compliant with what the town zoning or, or what the town center zoning ordinances say? Um, sorry, I just, just to, to quote from the town center design standards, it says, um, development in existing structures shall maintain the original rhythm and size of openings. 
And I think that was put in there for existing structures because it's very difficult for existing structures to meet current um, design standards. And um, in an effort to meet the design standards, we actually have added that door with the transom above it to try and get closer to the 50-50 fenestration requirement. Um, but uh, as I stated, it, it's very difficult for existing buildings to meet my current design standards, which is why I believe that statement was put in the design standards um, requirements. So I have a question for Maureen. If we waive the road width on private access ways, how's that different? Well, if it's a private road, you are authorized under the subdivision ordinance. I think it's section 1635 has an explicit provision that allows you to waive certain standards. That's why when something is a subdivision, you have some authority to waive things. And the language there talks about uh, waiving things to promote better neighborhood development and not just to avoid uh, the standards that the town has established. Um, under private access way, it also says that you have authority to waive a few things. Uh, site plan does not say that. Resource okay. protection permits do, do not say that. Uh, All right. I, I, I'm on the side with Joe that we have enough information to say it's complete. But then, assuming we decide that is the case, then we get into the substantive review of the standard, meeting the standards or not. And then, you know, if they, if they meet or do not meet those standards. So we're, still, we have to, con, you know, confine ourselves to talking completeness. Right. And I, I understand that. I'm just looking for an answer from the applicant, not an excuse of what the, what he uh, believes the zoning ordinance says or what he believes with regards to um, uh, because it's an existing structure so if it came down to it and he sat down with his team and said okay well we need to get to that percentage of openings for the scott fire side whether or not they would be willing to make a bigger door would they be willing to put in a window what are their thoughts on that if they have to make or have to make um or get to the provisions that are necessary for what is in the town center zone minutes. Just like the answers the I don't know, then that's okay. But I'm just looking for something. Well, that goes to the merits of the application, John. I think Joe is correct that, that we're, we're ahead of ourselves. I think we can face your point when we get to the merits. If okay, I mean that was looking for something from the applicant, but if you guys want to move on, then. Well, well, I think, John, I think what you're asking me is why can't I meet the 50-50 guideline as presented in the town center standards? And um, the answer is it's incredibly expensive to meet that standard because it's a block building. So the, so the cost benefit analysis of how much would it be to expand the door, put an extra window, it would probably cost me an extra $5,000 just because it is a block building. And, um, and I've been putting in a lot of effort to try and meet the design standards in every other way, and including the parking lot and the siding. And, um, and I was hoping that this would be one provision that could be waived since there is language in it in the design center standards for pre-existing structures. So, well, we don't, have to decide now whether or not to waive that. Um, and I think we should do that. I think we should look at, we're gonna have to look at all the town center standards in relation to the building and the site. So I don't okay. I think uh, we shouldn't I'll, get too bogged down in this right, that's, one item. That's fine. We I'll may find five others that need to be addressed as well. All right, Joe, I'll move on from that. I just uh, thank okay. you for that, for that information. That's helpful to have. And I just wanted to remind the board that we had a applicant come to us in a workshop setting, not this property, but something else that was asking us to do the same thing with finding that Scott Dyer Road 
wasn't a primary road with regards to the town center zoning ordinance. And I think we all came to a consensus that that was not something that we could just simply find or waive or um, yeah. change because that's in the standard. So I just want to bring that up. I'll move on. Thank you for allowing me to talk about it. Okay. Hi, uh, Peter. Uh, a question for Jim. Uh, when you talked about the traffic study, you I thought you dismissed something in it as is not relevant, but I'm I'm not sure why that's the case. And that is on page two, they talk about the uh, high crash uh, site left hand turns uh, either from the eastbound uh, approach from Ocean House Road or from Scott Dyer. In other words, turning across traffic uh, into the site and. It said further study of the stated crash pattern should be undertaken before deciding upon appropriate mitigation. Uh, that kind of left me dangling. Uh, they, they didn't seem to speak to the high crash problem, saying it ought to be looked at some more. What, could you uh, explain that? Yes, I think Bill, what Bill, uh, the uh, uh, traffic engineer that uh, we had working on this project is uh, Bill Bray from Traffic Solutions. I think what he was referring to is the preponderance of the crashes that are um, uh, occurring at that intersection are basically between shore on the other side of the road between shore road and the entrance to the uh, filling state to the uh, uh, Cumberland farms on that side. That's not what it says. I mean, that, that sentence is, is, is not talking about that part of uh, 77. It's talking right. about left hand turn from the eastbound approach or from Scott Dyer into the into the Cumberland farm site, meaning, you know, the old Cumbies, what we're talking about here. I, I, I'm just puzzled as to uh, why I made the point and then just left it dangling. Uh, I certainly didn't mean to leave it dangling. I just think that uh, I, I'm, I didn't read that as the, the into the site. I think, and I may be mistaken, but I think they were talking about the actual intersection, uh, not the actual drive into the site. Um, and that intersection is a little bit compromised because uh, there's that big bulb area that is actually DOT property, uh, or it's not our property to be sure. It talks um, about motorists attempting to enter the Cumberland Farm site via a left-hand turn, a uh, left turn movement from either the eastbound approach of Ocean House or from Scott Dyer approach. So they're talking about going from either of the two uh, bounding streets into this site, turning left across traffic and says that ought to be studied further. I, I'm, I'm just sort of baffled as to what to make of that. Um, I. We well, can certainly get Bill, uh, the uh, traffic engineer, to be able to uh, uh, address that a little bit more in detail. I did ask him about that, and he had said to me that the, the issue was not really this particular locus as far as the crash site for the intersection. It's more the uh, where the two where, where Shore, Scott Dyer, and Ocean House come together as far as the high crash volumes. Uh, toward that end, we can certainly have him uh, um, revise his assessment a little bit more to make that a little bit more clear regarding this particular locus. If, if I could be clarified, that would be quite helpful. Sure, not a problem. All right, I would like to open this up to a public hearing on the issue of completeness. Maureen, do we have people teed up? Uh, we have so, um, five attendees and uh, no one has raised their hands, so now would be the time to raise your hand if you want to say anything. Okay. No one has raised their hand. All right, then the public hearing is closed. So uh, let's continue our discussion of completeness. Um, let's start with uh, the town center standards. Um, I think we all know them pretty well and you may have reviewed them for this. Do you feel, is there anybody who feels there's an insufficient amount of information to evaluate whether this pro application complies with the town center standards? Uh, the town center standards or has enough information for us to move forward and further further discuss the town center standards. Okay, I, I agree with that assessment. Anybody else have? Uh... I agree. 
I agree. Okay. I agree. And then in terms of uh, the remainder of the site uh, drawings and requirements, see anybody see any glaring issues? Joe, Joe, this is Dan. Um, I've yes. got another question about this traffic study. Okay. On, yeah, on page three uh, in the summary, um, item number three, there's the consultant talks about site distance and um, rec recommendations that existing landscaping located near the right turn lane from Ocean House Road to Scott Dyer Road be removed as noted on the attached plan to improve the site distance uh, left from Scott Dyer Road driveway entrance. So my question is, is, is on what attached plan is, and is that shown on um, the site plan? And um, I think that's, you know, kind of following up with Peter's concern. I think that, I think that the applicant needs to spend a little bit more time looking at the traffic implications uh, for this site. Okay, is there, Jim, is there an, a plan that was supposed to be attached to that? Um, it's the typical site plan that you see that's got some of the, I'd say typical, it's a, a sheet, uh, I believe it's the sheet three of five, uh, that shows some of the existing plantings that are already there. That's where that big catalpa tree is located. Um, and then there are a few smaller bushes that are over in that area and then some uh, larger trees. Uh, I think what Bill was referring to is that um, when somebody is coming up to uh, the intersection from Scott Dyer Road facing into, old, into Ocean House, that there is a bit of a challenge, or there can be, depending on how close the, uh, uh, the car is to or the vehicle is to actually Ocean House Road, um, that uh, the sight distance may be a little compromised. Uh, sight distance meaning for uh, looking for oncoming traffic coming up the hill of uh, of Ocean House toward the center of town. Uh, that area, we, we don't have a problem removing any of that. That's not our property. Uh, the DOT generally doesn't have an issue if we ask toward that end. Uh, and uh, Bill, I think Bill did talk to them, and they, but we haven't gotten any information toward that end. It was more of a let us know if you need to do something. Um, so you're talking about, if I'm looking at the plan, the area to the right of the vertical property line. Correct. And that, you're right, that whole area has a lot of plant in where the flagpole is. Yes. And that's the, that's what's creating the, the site distance issues. Yes. Okay. To the extent that, uh, I mean, the issue is, is exist. And they certainly do for, if, if a car pulls far enough up toward the crosswalk to stop at the stop bar, uh, it's not too much of an issue. But uh, for those of us who are well aware of this particular intersection, uh, when traffic is coming in either direction and somebody is coming from a side street, i.e. Shore or Scott Dyer, the ten people tend to uh, enter the intersection rather quickly to be able to get ahead of ongoing traffic. One of the things that I talked to Bill about was his comment saying, in order to be able to improve that overall intersection, it might be nice to take out a little bit of that, uh, that, that low growing bushes uh, and possibly even one or two of the trees or at least to limb them up just to improve the sight distance for people who are at that little intersection island that you see in the lower right hand corner. Well, we're happy to do that. That's not an issue. I just want to point out that it's not our land. Um, assuming the DOT doesn't have a problem with that, which they typically don't, then there's no problem with us. Um, but we can't force them to remove any of the vegetation or allow us to remove any of the vegetation that's not on our property. Okay. All right. Uh, so sounds like we're at a good point to uh, consider completeness. Is there anyone who would like to make a motion? I'll make it. I'd like to okay. sign it. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Michael Friedland doing business CDA Yam Yams LLC for site plan review to operate a retail lumber store with DIY classes in the existing 1980 square foot building located at 287 Ocean House Road be deemed complete. Do I have a second? I'll second. Is that Peter? 
Yep. Okay. Any discussion? Maureen, can you take a roll call vote? Mr. Bedensky? Yes. Mr. Curry? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Hubner? Yes. Ms. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Sarbeck? No. Mr. Shala? Yes. The motion for completeness passes. Okay. Um, so normally we would discuss a site walk. However, what I would like to do if everybody's okay with it is go through the town center standards in a somewhat comprehensive way and see how much work needs to be done on the application because I think if there's a lot that has to be changed then it would behoove us to table the application wait for the changes and then uh, do a site walk. Does uh, anybody have any issues or comments on that? Maureen? Uh, that's definitely something you can do. I, I, I don't want to be uh, difficult, but I'd like to point out that it is 10.05 p.m. Are you proposing we do this in another meeting or are you proposing we do this now? My sense of Joe, there's a long way to go on this stuff. Well, I guess we could uh, take a vote. See what everybody wants to do. Joe, if I may. Jim, yeah. Um, we suddenly realize that there's a lot to be done as far as the architectural plans are concerned. We can certainly speak with the architect toward that end and, and uh, make sure he addresses them according to all those standards and according to the comments this evening. As far as scheduling a site walk, um, it might be uh, uh, behoove us, uh, if, if you want a site walk, we all pretty much know what the site is, but we're happy to entertain uh, a site walk of the area. Nothing that we're gonna be looking at, notwithstanding the, uh, the parking area is really going to change uh, in terms of anything major that we're going to be viewing at, on the uh, project or on the property. So toward that end, if it pleases the board, um, can we schedule a site walk this evening or can we schedule it this evening for a time that's coming up an evening or a weekend or whenever you decide to have the site walks? Um, and then we can present the information for uh, the new architectural information at the next meeting and ostensibly receive approvals. And we would have already had the, uh, the site walk uh, behind us if the board is interested in doing a site walk? Well, here's my problem. I feel like this building really has a long way to go before it complies with the town center standards. And I think it's a long discussion. And, you know, we either launch into it or table it till the next meeting. I mean, I think your designer has to really review the standards and take a look at what other buildings in the town center look like and you know do some thinking about it and come up with come up with a, a concept that addresses the standards a lot better than it does that's just my opinion and do you, do you mind if I, do you mind if I Hold on, no. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the discussion the board needs to have. And that's why I'm, I'm I think Carol Ann's right. We either launch into this or we table it till next meeting. And um, I would be opposed to uh, scheduling a sidewalk until we've had the discussion. So I'm just one person. I'd really like to know what the rest of you think on the, the planning board members. So Carol Ann. 
I just wonder, having a discussion without the architect, does that make sense? Uh, maybe I'll ask him that question. Would you want to have that kind of discussion without the architect present? Um, given that we're not architects, I think it would be beneficial certainly to be able to have the discussion with the architect present. I mean, you can certainly address a few things that I would not be able to or we might not be able to. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand Joe's comment. I'm just not, given that the building is not proposed, the, the physical structure of the building is not uh, proposed to be altered in any way. Uh, well, we no, you are altering it. You're getting rid of windows. You're cutting that big opening for a new, for the new door, double door. You're putting a metal roof on there. You're deleting the dip thing at the top. You're changing the window configure. You know, you're changing the historic window configurations. You, you're doing a lot to it. Uh, absolutely. It's to not, the building, you're not, it's not, you can't say that you're not changing it. No, yeah. the, the, not the physical construction. So that's why I want to have, that's why I need a, we need a discussion. Yeah, um, if I could chime in for a second, I've, I've read through the design standards and I've, and I've tried to see where we wouldn't meet them. And I've talked with the architect about this. And you? We've also looked at the buildings in the area and the building across the street has a metal roof. And uh, most of the buildings have clapboards. Um, and so we've really went through the design, the town standards. And if you have specifics on what you would like to see, I, I I'd be happy to try and comply with those, but uh, from reading through the standards, I, I wasn't sure what else we could do on the existing building to comply. All right, so I'm gonna put it to the board again. Do you guys wanna launch into it or do you wanna table this, Maureen? Your, your mic's off, Maureen. Okay, Thank you. I just wanna make sure it's clear because this has been an issue for the code enforcement officer as well that the term architect has been used. The applicant does not have an architect that we know of that's working on this project. Yeah, an architect can only be used for registered architect in the state of Maine. There, it, unless, unless he's a new secret member of the team, the drawings that you have have not been prepared by an architect. No, I, I apologize. He's a designer. He's a home builder and he designs okay. new homes. So yep. sorry about that. My apologies. Hey, Joe. So what do you want to do? John, this is, so f from um, the statement that was made by the applicant's team, it sounded like they wanted to go back and talk amongst themselves to address some of the issues that were brought up by us tonight. So I think doing this on, a f on the fly isn't really going to be the best use of all of our time. Okay. Um, so I would I would say let's do this at a at a different time and not launch into this at this point. Yeah, I, I agree. everybody agree. Yeah, uh, I Andrew. Agree. I think Andrew I, yes. Yeah, pretty, and so do I. Uh, Dan agrees, Joe. Peter. Yep. Jim. Yeah, agreed. All right. Well. Then let's make somebody make a motion and table this. You just want to table it to the next meeting, not yeah, not set a public hearing. Yeah, no, that too. Um, can Can I ask one question of the board? One question. Um, I, if they could provide specifics on exactly what they would want, because I'll read through the standards and I'll and I'll be guessing a bit on what you guys want. But if you guys well, want to that's what an architect does. That's what a designer does. And I'm sorry to get snippy, but it's not the job of the planning board to design something. Okay, the, the, the ordinance calls for distinctive entrance. So do you have a distinctive entrance? I felt I did. Well, I don't know. I mean, that's something that we can all look at and yay or nay it, but I mean, that your, your designer should come to the board and say, here is what I've done for distinctive entrance. This is why it's a distinctive entrance. And it's the same for all of the, all of the items. Sorry, I'm looking at the wrong monitor here. But it's the same for all of the items in the town center standards. So well, I, I honestly did that's not my answer. 
Sorry, you know, I honestly did think I met them, and I wasn't trying to subvert any of the codes. I, I really did think I met them. I know, I know you're not, but uh, that's not my, I think that that's the job of a designer. I mean, we've had, look at the buildings that have been built here. The one right next to you, Sea Salt, Rudy's, um, Ocean House Commons, uh, the, the uh, building next to um, Key Bank, you know, down the street, they all came to us with uh, drawings that demonstrated compliance with the town center standards. All those are brand new structures, so it's a little more difficult. But, working with you know, you can do it with, with existing buildings. You can. I, I'm trying. I'm trying very hard. So, you have a motion? I'd, I'd like to get a motion to table this thing and okay. have a public hearing for next Okay, time. ready. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Michael Friedland, DBA, Yam Yams, LLC, for site plan review to operate a retail lumber store with DIY classes in the existing 1,980 square foot building located at 287 Ocean House Road be tabled to the regular May 19, 2020 meeting, at which time a public hearing will be held. Second. Thank you. Maureen. Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Mr. Shalott. No. All right, motion passes almost unanimously. <laughs> Great. Okay. So we will see you guys at the next meeting. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, next item, digital submission guidelines. During, uh, for the duration of the COVID-19 event, the following procedures must be used to provide digital documents for planning board submissions. Uh, I don't need to read all of this out loud, do I? Morning. Nope, you do not. So, so do you want me to just give you a brief presentation on this? Yeah, what did you change? Uh, well, the thing is, the board has never really had an opportunity to discuss this at a public meeting. So this was uh, drafted by uh, me in consultation with the planning board chair. And as uh, Peter Curry mentioned earlier, we're, we're in an evolving situation and things are going to change. And as they change, we're going to have to change with it. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So this is uh, what we're saying is this is going to be in effect during the COVID-19 event for as long as that happens, that uh, everything has to be submitted to the planning board in a digital format. Uh, Mr. Bedensky corrected my mistake. We're at 25 megabytes. Uh, we're saying that it has to be submitted at the same time as things always used to be submitted. Uh, we have a naming protocol, which I think, you know, with the number of documents we handled tonight, it becomes pretty clear why we need a naming protocol just to keep things straight. Uh, and then the other thing uh, that Joe mentioned that he was concerned about is if people can take all of their um, written materials and scan them into one PDF instead of using as multiple PDFs, which is what this sort of says right now, and then if they can take their plans and turning them into a plan set, kind of like the 18 Lightwood folks did, that would make it a little less cumbersome to handle the documents. So this little red stuff is supposed to cover that whole, we, we'd prefer to have things in, in one or two pieces. It was and nice and that's, that's, cool. all, that's all there is. I also updated it so it said it had eight, eight, eight sets. I'm hoping all of you got your packages and that you were satisfied with how they were handled. If you want to do it a different way, now would be a great time to talk about that as well. 
uh, anybody want to make a comment? So I, I think that, I mean, the way you now give architectural drawings to the city of Portland is there's a drawings file and a documents file. And I think that is just makes your life a lot easier. If you can open one file, like, with, like in the case of 287, you could open one file with all of Jim's drawings and all the building drawings and just be able to scroll through them and get what you need. Same with a binder. I mean, a, a, the binders like uh, John Mitchell usually hands us, it's, that's a com one complete PDF with everything in it. And I think it's just, because then we still have the memo to put in that same folder. So we should have three files for each uh, application, basically. So Which Joe, do you want me to erase this part up here? I think it just, you know, the, I did that. They, the city of Portland did that for like, and I think it just never worked. So yeah, I agree with you. Everybody crazy because they you you have to name the files exactly the same and you know and then you wouldn't and Andrew I, I'm before you delete that Maureen what I might suggest is that something like the uh, table you have there would give the examples of what would go into the drawing set and the document set yeah and and then the naming convention actually should be incredibly specifically laid out. So it would be last name and X number of characters, underscore the year, underscore drawing or something like that. So that everything is incredibly uniform. You're not, you can, so you can guess looking at the name as to exactly what it is, which is what you kind of did here anyway. But I, I agree, I think having just three files rather than 10 and would just be immensely better i agree even for just for file handling purposes on the town's end yeah and they're mostly gonna fit i mean they'll mostly be small enough you may occasionally get one or two that have to be broken up my dream is before we get a major new subdivision we don't meet like this anymore. <laughs> it's a meet in person. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's get those. Um, okay. Maureen, does that give you enough? Yes. Good. Um, the only thing that I just wanted to add, and maybe I'm being a little picky here, but do you want to outline or define what it means when you say COVID-19 event or a timeline for that, just because there might be open to interpretation on when that ends and if it keeps going. And so I just want to throw that out there. I kind of like the, uh, the generic sense of it because I do think that over time things are going to change and that well, I mean, uh, this was already my third draft of this, so <laughs> I kind of, I kind of liked it being a little broad, a little broad umbrella. So it's, it's all this is is for. It's not that big of a deal, I don't think, if it's not defined. But I just thought it might be a little bit more clear. Uh, but I'm not. I'm okay if you want to keep it pretty generic. I, I, I guess I, I mean, my recommendation would be to keep it generic for now. Yeah, Andrew. I'm okay with that. I, um, this is, I'm wondering actually, I actually think this might be a very useful thing to have uh, to put into the record going forward period for e even if we go back to getting big packets and that's all we're really looking at by the board. Um, I think the public certainly would benefit from more detailed, you know, the getting the plan sets or whatever. Um, my opinion. So just thinking about sort of the long term, it might not be a bad thing to think about it and, and really nail it down. Um, if and I don't know what kind of change would need to happen if this is in an emergency situation situation to make this happen. 
but certainly making it as easy for you to deal with as possible would be good. And I do think it provides more detail that the you know people of Cape Elizabeth wouldn't have to come to you for necessarily. That's just my just a thought anyway. Yeah, I, I think I haven't heard any and I haven't heard a lot from the public, but I know in the past we have had people want to see everything online. So I'm hoping some of those folks are really happy now. Um, I'm trying to couch this as a during the COVID event because I think it kind of gives us this umbrella of being able to do things in an emergency. Um, how people submit applications is in our ordinance. So if we wanted to turn this into something permanent, we would have to go and make some ordinance changes. Not, not that big a deal, but it is a process. It takes a few months and wanted to get this in place. Well, I mean, I guess this gives us a good opportunity to test drive some things and see how we think they're, how, how we think it's working. And um, for me, I could see it being a good change, but um, that's just my opinion. Did anybody try reviewing all the material without opening the envelope? No. No. No, but it is a nice no. idea to zoom in. My oh, envelope's screen. still unopened. Oh. I, I need a much bigger screen. Yeah, yeah, the paper stuff is still pretty good. My screen's like this. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, that is tough though. All right, we had enough of that one? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I forget, what's the last thing? Adjourn. <laughs> Sleep. Okay, can I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Who was the second? Call out. Jim. <laughs> Mr. Bedensky. Oh, yes. Yes, I'm sorry. We've already signed I'm in, up. A, I'm in a coma. <laughs> Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Hell yeah. <laughs> Ms. Jordan. I'm with Jim. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Sarbeck. No, I want to take this opportunity to talk. <laughs> 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 yes, yes, yes. Are people picking on you? Is that it? We're, we're filibustering and, at and, this point. And Mr. <laughs> and, and Mr. Shalott. You bet. I just wanted to check and see that, that we had no more attendees. So yeah. I think we need to limit the number of items on the agenda while we're meeting like this. <laughs> well, hopefully, I think people are going to have fewer technical issues and. Uh, I don't know, Maureen. Do you um, do you uh, advise people to like get on Zoom on their computer and just take it for a test run? The, it's not that um, hard everyone, to do. I, yeah, no. Everyone that was on the uh, March planning board meeting that you did not hold, um, I yeah. sent them an invite to attend your April workshop, and I know that they. I know some of them did. Um, okay. No one actually contacted me to try to test out the equipment. Um, but, you know, I, I think part of the problem is if people are in Cape in places that are not, don't have good internet, I think that's a part of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, I found tonight that I got one message, someone I was trying to promote to panelists where it said the only way I could let him speak is if I promoted him to panelists because he had an older version of Zoom. So oh. yeah. there are some of those issues. I, I think most I, I think not that many of your problems tonight were operator error so that's a step forward. <laughs> Maureen can I ask one question um, do we have things planned for the workshop next month's workshop and yes the things um, the pipeline there, for the May official meeting. All right so um, I did get a request oh Dr. Zev uh, would like to be on the May workshop so that, that's a project um, you have two ordinance changes, which uh, we've kind of sh put to the side right now, but we may have to get back into. And then uh, I can tell you that the ordinance committee 
has completed its recommendation and is sending it to the council. So that's going to be arriving sooner or later in front of the planning board and you, you are going to have to work on that. Is that short term rentals? Yes. You caught the enthusiasm, didn't you? Well, you know, if you guys want to jump, get a jump on that, you could go to the website where the meetings calendar is and review the minutes of the nine meetings that the ordinance committee held on that. Hmm. Wow. And let's just say some of those meetings are double digit pages on minutes. Hmm. Maybe you can just do a presentation for us. Like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that suggestion. Yeah. I have a I have a question. Uh oh. Yes, you're on me. I lost my internet connection for about five minutes, and I wondered did you did you want a site walk for the two eighty seven Ocean House Road? Uh, Hiromi, maybe you should just call me tomorrow <laughs> before we pick up that scab. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. I will. Please, please just call me tomorrow. <laughs> just please note my no vote on completeness. You are still recording though, Maureen. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I gave you a desperate phone message, but it's okay. All right. I, um, yeah, I was a little bit back. Yeah, all right. I, I, I heard someone say we needed to stop, stop recording now, so. Yeah, that would be okay. good. We're adjourned. Uh, how about, yeah. All right. All right, yeah, folks. We're good. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Great job. Stay Good healthy. Night. Good job, Good Joe. Bye bye. Way to go, Joe. Thank Good job, you. Joe. You're a veteran, Joe. Yeah, yeah. you're not that sick, Kim Jong Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I like Pete's ladder that 